Jamie Newton. Ok, we try again. <laughs> Buongiorno a tutte e a tutti. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this beautiful space uh, at the University of Padova. My name is Claudia Padovani. Uh, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Italian uh, Scholars at Risk uh, Network uh, together with Professor Francesca Helm. We are both from the Department of Politics, Law and International Studies uh, and we coordinate the Italian uh, uh, SAR section together with Professor Esther Gallo from the University of Trento. We're very pleased to welcome you all, uh, very pleased to have friends also following online. Uh, this is a very special moment for us. We've been working on this idea and uh, having the possibility to convene friends and colleagues uh, here in Padova for a long time. Uh, so finally, we managed, and this is um, it's a pleasant uh, uh, opportunity. We're really honored. Uh, so we are starting this conference um, with, uh, of course, institutional welcome addresses, uh, and then at the end, uh, I will uh, give some housekeeping uh, announcements uh, and some uh, details about the program. Um, initially, uh, I'm conveying the greetings from the University of Padova. Professor Cristina Basso, who is the Vice Rector for International Relations, she really wanted to be with us, but we have a new COVID wave undergoing, and so unfortunately, Cristina cannot be with us, uh, uh, but she would have liked uh, to join uh, uh, the meeting and be with us uh, for the day. So I will just say uh, a few remarks, few words uh, about the University hosting this event. As you all know from the program, University of Padova is celebrating 800 years of its history, a history uh, that has been marked by the principle and value of libertas from the very beginning. And as you know, the university motto, Universa Universis Patavina Libertas, really speak to the commitment of the university from its very beginning uh, to live up to the expectation that uh, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, will be part of the experience of the university. And that's, uh, has been, that has been uh, the, uh, the inspiration and also the reality. So as uh, SAR Italy and SAR representatives in Padova, we started thinking about this conference uh, a few years ago. Sometime events like this uh, take a long time <laughs> to realize. Uh, so I remember in 2019, uh, uh, I attended a, a SAR-related event in Ljubljana. And then on my way back on the train, I was writing this program for the then uh, Vice Rector for International Relations, Professor Pacaniella, who have always been very supportive of the activities. And of course, part of the program was uh, we need to have a major event. And then COVID came, and then we had to postpone. And then finally, the event is taking place now, which is uh, the middle of the actual year when we are uh, celebrating. And we feel this is, in the end, very fortunate because we had the feeling uh, walking the, the, the squares of Padova and attending some of the meetings that have already been organized uh, in the context of this celebration that this year is very special, uh, that the concept and principle of freedom uh, is really informing and it's embedded uh, in so many of the activities. Uh, we've had uh, for a few years uh, some freedom lectures uh, with major prominent names, uh, we have music uh, uh, events organized as Opera Libera. So the Libertas uh, is really the running uh, theme across all uh, that we're doing. And it's part of the history. So for those who may not be familiar, Padova was funded in 2022, uh, so 800 years ago, by a group of scholar and student uh, who left the University of Bologna that was funded uh, a short uh, uh, before because they wanted to do research and to be able to work on the research and their sharing of knowledge with more freedom, which they found uh, in this very space. And then, of course, uh, we will hear, particularly in the first panel this morning, how this whole Libertas uh, principle has accompanied uh, most of the activities through the years, uh, through the Middle Ages, uh, uh, up to 1678, when the University of Padova managed to grant the first doctoral certificate ever in the world to a woman, Elena Cornaro Piscopia. And since then, uh, we like also to, uh, to highlight uh, this. Uh, and of course, university is working hard uh, to keep in that tradition. And then finally, University of Padova was the only university in Italy to be awarded a civic gold medal after uh, the Second World War for its initiative uh, for resistance uh, uh, against the oppression. So that leads us uh, uh, to today. And of course, today, um, 
we believe universities uh, in the position to take responsibility to face some of the challenges that we are witnessing, and challenges are certainly high. So uh, what's the role of scholars at risk in all this? Uh, it's probably to, uh, to maintain a tradition, to expand the tradition, to call upon the university governance uh, to live up to the tradition and to the expectation. And we're trying to do this uh, also through events like this and through the many collaborations that you will see are present today in the person of uh, uh, people like uh, those uh, uh, that are sitting with me and those who will be speaking after. Uh, so one thing that we would like to announce, this is the first announcement ever, uh, the University of Padova has a magazine, a scientific magazine, it's called Bo Live, uh, which is widely read, uh, it's well respected and well known, and so starting today, the Bo Live will have uh, a section, a series dedicated to academic freedom and its theme. Uh, which is something we managed, uh, we discussed uh, uh, with the editorial team. Uh, we're pleased to say this here because, of course, uh, there may be thoughts, ideas, uh, uh, and comments uh, coming out of this conference, even from many of you who are participating. And if you would like to share those with us, uh, we can actually propose and publish. Uh, we will have some of the activities uh, done by students that were presented yesterday and will again be presented tomorrow also displayed uh, in that series. And the series remain open for anyone uh, who would like to contribute uh, scientific comments, uh, uh, personal comments, uh, so that we can keep this conversation going on after the conference. Now the conference has been organized, as I said, by SAR uh, Italy uh, in collaboration with SAR Europe. And here, SAR Europe is represented by Joel Hanisek uh, and also Denise Roche, uh, project manager and advocacy manager of SAR Europe that is based in Minot University. Uh, also in collaboration with SAR Sweden. Uh, we have an ongoing collaboration with SAR Sweden since a couple of years ago in the context of uh, Sweetly, an initiative that was uh, initiated by the Rector's Conference uh, from Italy and Sweden. And we've already been learning a lot from each other, but we hope to continue uh, learning and exchanging over the next few years. Many people has contributed, have contributed to this conference, uh, so just briefly we would like to uh, thank them all, uh, because this event uh, could not have been possible without them. So from the International Relations Office at the University of Padova, Dora Longoni was with us yesterday. Um, and we would also like to thank Mattia Guzella and in particular Chiara Crozzoletti, who's been coordinating all the organizational activities. Chiara, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to thank colleagues from the DISGEA uh, department that is, uh, has played a prominent role and we will hear more about uh, in the coming session. As I said, SAR Italy is co-coordinated with Esther Gallo, University of Trento, has been very active. We would like to thank students uh, from the seminars and the legal clinic that have worked with us and with our colleagues uh, in different universities. We would like to thank all the scholars uh, that are hosted uh, in our universities uh, who traveled all the way to be with us in Padova. We had an amazing meeting yesterday and we really feel that uh, this is partly why we wanted to organize this conference. So really thank uh, for being with us. Thanks to the service, of course, uh, that is helping us. Uh, thanks to the department that is hosting uh, this event. Uh, thanks to our uh, Dean, uh, Professor Elena Pariotti, for their support. Uh, uh, our department within the university has been the one that probably started first. Uh, hosting scholars, organizing things, being involved, uh, and, and much time Francesca and I have dedicated to this was stolen from the activities we would have done for the department. So uh, thank you for your support. Um, so with that said, uh, I would like to give the floor to our, uh, uh, to our uh, guests. Uh, as I said, uh, there is a long-standing and even longer, of course, uh, standing collaboration with, uh, with Sweden. So with us, uh, we have this morning uh, Professor uh, Eva Biberg, Vice Chancellor of the University of Gothenburg. And uh, Eva, I see you are with us. So please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. We don't hear you yet. We do not, we do not hear for some reason.
in Zoom, she can be heard, so maybe it's a problem we have in the room. Just wait one second. You may try now. This is unfortunate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this. Uh, Eva, we, we still do not hear you. So I wonder if it would be the same. Can I ask uh, uh, Professor Astrid uh, Söderberg Bidding, who is uh, president of the Swedish Rectors Conference and also vice chancellor, of Stockholm University to try and speak, and we just see if we can hear your voice. We cannot hear the voice. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. So our technicians are uh, trying to solve the problem, possibly quickly. We can try now. Sound is good in Zoom, so they can hear in Zoom. It's here in the in the hall. It's our audio system. Can you try now, Eva? I'm looking at the back there because we have service sending messages. Very sorry about this. It was working yesterday perfectly. We didn't have any problem. So as it happens. more support uh, from the technicians from this place. Loro in Zoom sentono, quindi... We know you have um, other meetings to attend, so we were actually hoping to stick within the time that was uh, initially announced. So I'm asking the technician if maybe we just uh, stick to Zoom, uh, if Zoom is operating and, and maybe no streaming. Marco, Francesco, se noi passiamo Zoom e basta. Sì, però non abbiamo un microfono per sentirlo. Ok. 
Okay, so we apologize for those of you who are in the hall, as we realize that people can actually hear perfectly on Zoom. Uh, we will move on. We will have the, the greetings and remarks from Professor Wieberg and Professor Soderberg reading, and we will record on Zoom and we will display afterwards. So Eva, please, uh, you have the floor. We will just follow your lips. <laughs> Francesco. Please go ahead. University was founded on that important principle. So we celebrate with of Italian and then entered the governing bodies of Swedish universities. So I'm therefore extra proud and happy to have initiated the academic collaboration Sweetly between my two home countries. Sweetly aims at, at strengthening the academic collaboration between our two countries and bringing our universities closer together. And this was also pointed out by the previous speaker. Um, it is coordinated jointly by the University of Padua, Örebro University, and University of Gothenburg. And until today, almost 30 higher education institutions in Sweden and Italy are part of Sweetly. This emphasizes the sense of connectedness and belief in common values between European universities. Sweetly has three different themes, at least for now, for collaboration. It's, it's aging, aging, it's artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence, and academic freedom. Through Sweetly, the Italian SAR section, headed by the University of Padova, and the Swedish SAR section, headed by the University of Gothenburg, have identified several key issues to collaborate on. From advocacy for the Iranian researchers Almadresa Dialali to a newly launched series of training seminars for risk scholars on rebuilding careers in ex exile. Furthermore, the two SAR sections organized a pre conference yesterday, as was said, on student involvement and responsible internationalization, thus highlighting areas of interest to network members. 
And we see now that the rationale of strengthening collaboration within Europe is as important as ever. In recent year, events, Europe has shown that we stand together in what we believe in. And I think in this perspective, closer ties among our institutions have become even more relevant. We need to build a common future. We need to support one another in good times and in times of hardship. The University of Gothenburg is up till now the only higher education institution in Sweden that offers Ukrainian as a language subject. And we have introduced ex extra courses for this since the breakout of the war against Ukraine. Even more important to, is to contribute to the long-term solutions and help with the rebuilding of Ukrainian academia. Much work will be needed over a long time to improve the conditions for those who have been affected by war, invasion and totalitarian mis misuse of power so that social freedoms and democracy can be restored. In turbulent times like these, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, higher education institutions are charged with standing tall and continuing to communicate facts and knowledge. As experts, the role of researchers in the public discourse cannot be overstated. They must, they must continue to dare to ask difficult questions and critically examine claims. That is the very heart of our work. So, in conclusion, the Libertas Conference is an important contribution to the dialogue on the challenges we face and how to overcome them. I wish you all now a very proficuous and inspiring conference. Vi auguro una conferenza che vi ispiri ad ulteriori attività e progetti per un futuro migliore. Grazie. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Wieberg. Thank you very much. We finally managed to actually hear your voice uh, clear and loud and also your words. Uh, thank you for reminding the latest uh, uh, challenges and the conflict uh, that is uh, afflicting and affecting uh, the whole context. Uh, Thank you also for reminding that we should not, we should not forget in any case uh, many of the other crises. And so all our universities have been affected and very much involved uh, with what was going on in Afghanistan last year and of course is still uh, ongoing. Uh, also thank you for mentioning the situation of Dr. Jalali. We, we also mentioned Jalali yesterday, so he is uh, uh, with us uh, in our, in our uh, thoughts. Uh, and we hope to continue, of course, this collaboration. So I'm now giving the floor to Professor Astrid söderberg Widing, President of the Swedish Rector's Conference and Vice-Chancellor of Stockholm University. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, dear friends, it is my honor and my great pleasure as Chair of the Swedish Association of Higher Education Institutions as well as Vice Chancellor of Stockholm University, to join you today as one of the introductory speakers on this very important occasion of the Libertas Conference, celebrating the eighth centenary of the University of Padova, along with eight centuries of engaging in academic freedom, but also recognizing the challenges today in order to continue to protect and promote it. First of all, let me offer my heartfelt congratulations on your 800th anniversary, but not least also for your long-standing and important commitment to academic freedom. Let me also say how grateful we are from the Swedish side within the Sweet Italy collaboration that the University of Padova, together with Scholars at Risk Italy and Europe, have organized this important conference and that we, that we may take part in it. The pre-conference program yesterday certainly looked very exciting, and I'm sure that the rest of the program will be just as important and rewarding. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to attend the conference in person in Padova, but there is a reason why. Uh, St Stockholm University and myself have just hosted a three-day international workshop together with the Magna Carta Observatory, where I also have the honor of serving as vice president for participants old and new in the Living Values Project, where we shared experiences 
on working to promote academic freedom and autonomy, and also how to best develop this work for the future, but where we also had the immense privilege of having founding executive director of Scholars at Risk, Rob Quinn, as one of our main speakers. After eloquently having taken us through the not so simple question of defining academic freedom and telling us about data available, such as the Academic Freedom Index, which I know is also on the agenda here, his emphasis was on the greatest challenge of all, namely of actually implementing it in our universities, which however is a task that is not only challenging, but also highly motivating. Here, I'm convinced that having students on board is one key to success. We were happy to have Marina Darmarin, president of the European Students' Union in Stockholm as a speaker. And I know that this perspective is also in focus in Padova. Magna Carta and Scholars at Risk are already good partners, but there is certainly room for even further development when it comes to a more systematic involvement of students in the work on academic freedom, on responsible internationalization, and in supporting both scholars and students at risk. The latter, of course, being more important than for many years on the European continent with the ongoing war in Ukraine. From the Swedish side, the awareness of the importance of working very actively with these issues has constantly been growing, been growing during the past years due to both the many threats against academic freedom and thus the difficulties for collaboration with an increasing number of countries where there are issues in res this respect or threats against individual scholars. Thus, apart from several new universities signing the Magna Carta or engaging with the Living Values Initiative, or not least joining scholars at risk, uh, we have also initiated a common work in Sweden on responsible internationalization with an appointed expert panel offering advice to universities on collaborating with different and difficult countries or regions. This is still a quite new initiative, but I'm convinced that it will offer important support on these very complex matters. Academic freedom is key for our work as scholars and as universities. Without it, we lose our credibility and society will lose trust in us. And when it is threatened in one country, scholars are at risk and there is need to take measures to be able to continue international collaboration with that particular country, if it is at all possible. I think we are all painfully aware of actual examples where it is not. But in spite of our awareness of these difficulties, so present for many of us today, we still seem to take academic freedom for granted a little too easily. Hence, the great importance of this conference, aiming at exploring its spaces and practices in depth. In order to do so, a continuous dialogue is needed, as well as a tireless work to really delve deep into the matter, to constantly revive our commitment and to engage actively across borders, between university and society, as well as between countries, to make our vision come true, the vision of a free academic community, deeply committed to the pursuit of truth, as well as engaged with society. This is indeed the main vision and mission for us as universities. So I hope for really productive exchanges during this conference and for the dialogue to continue beyond it. Viva Libertas! and similar reflection in our uh, context as well. 
Um, it would have been really nice and appropriate, actually, to have with us uh, Professor uh, Maurizio Tira, uh, who was supposed to speak at this point. Um, Professor Tira is a uh, rector of the University of Brescia, and he is also the person in charge of international relations in the Italian Rectors Conference. And he's been following closely uh, Sweetly collaboration activities, so he's been with us on other occasions. We know he's busy with the conference in Brescia, so he was not sure he could make it. But uh, uh, so we will convey, of course. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it would have been good for him uh, to be part of this uh, of this initial session because we do really feel uh, that it's crucial for Sar Italy to have the full support of the Italian Rectors Conference uh, in any of the activities and the matters uh, that we expect uh, to be carrying on in the future. So I'm now giving the floor to Joel Hanisek, uh, who is here representing Sar Europe and, uh, and the beautiful collaboration that we started with Sar Europe. Well, um, my sincere thanks to, uh, to Vice Director Basso, even in absence, um, to Professor Pariotti, uh, Professor Baldo, uh, and of course, Professors um, uh, Padovani and uh, Helm for hosting us uh, at the University of Padova during this uh, quite momentous occasion of uh, marking 800 years. Uh, I'm very glad to bring a warm welcome from Scholars at Risk Europe, alongside my colleague Denise Roach and our director Sinead O'Gorman. While reflecting on academic freedom across the centuries here in this place, uh, I'm very mindful that the Scholars at Risk Italy section was founded, or rather launched at the University of Padova only in 2019. Uh, and yet what an amazing amount of work this network has done across these very difficult years. So we therefore very much like to thank SAR Italy members for all of the extra efforts, all of the extra hours, and all of the volunteer coordination, both institutional and individual, uh, that you've been undertaking to protect and promote academic freedom. Working to, promote, to include academic freedom within the curriculum, leading on student advocacy initiatives, and building towards a national fellowship scheme in Italy are only a few examples, but they all seem to be marked by a characteristic emphasis on solidarity and welcome and hospitality in ways that really do truly motivate and inspire the wider SAR network, both in Europe and beyond. And so it's wonderful to see such productive collaboration with SAR Sweden and Swedish universities along these lines as well. We know that the spaces and practices of academic freedom, which your efforts maintain, do have direct impacts upon researchers at risk and in the most recent responses to colleagues from Afghanistan and Ukraine, we're especially appreciative of the support and flexibility that the Italian Rectors Conference has demonstrated. I'd like to close by specifically welcoming the new MSCA for Ukraine grants under Horizon Europe, which will importantly enable researchers from Ukraine to continue their research and also to facilitate reintegration when safe conditions for return are met. We're also aware and grateful that wider discussions about country agnostic European fellowship schemes are ongoing. And on that note, uh, I would like to thank all here who continue to be steadfast in the work on lesser known or underreported contexts where the spaces and practices of academic freedom remain no less at stake. Um, I look forward to these next two days uh, and thank you again for the warm welcome. Thanks, Joel. You already mentioned basically all the points that will be addressed over the next few days. So we will be discussing institutional commitments uh, from European institutions uh, and what, what is Europe doing to translate the principles into action. Uh, we will be discussing the role and relevance of uh, working with students uh, in student seminar and, and legal clinics, uh, and we will hear from the students. And most of all, we will be discussing the effort that is being done in the European and Italian context in particular to set up a national program for scholarship for both scholars and students. So the way ahead is long, and of course uh, there is a lot to do, uh, but it's, it's great that we can join forces in doing this, of course also with the departments that are helping us and supporting 
in hosting and in carrying out all the activities. So I'm now giving the floor to Professor Elena Pariotti, who is the Dean of the Department of Political Science, Law, and International Studies. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm very glad to be here uh, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, Law, and International Studies, because uh, academic freedom is at the core of many actions that have been promoted by the department, and the department, as has been already said, uh, is very much involved uh, in almost all the initiatives uh, and uh, activities that uh, have been already mentioned uh, today. And uh, just to, to, to mention some initiatives, uh, I have to say that uh, academic freedom is uh, a, a crucial topic uh, of um, different forms of innovative teaching. Um, namely uh, the Students' Advocacy Seminars, which is uh, innovative uh, not, not only because uh, it is a, a form of uh, uh, active learning, but also because uh, it, it's a form of active learning um, uh, ruled through uh, virtual exchange and uh, it uh, contributes to the so-called uh, internationalization at home. And uh, it is a kind of uh, teaching and learning um, that can contribute uh, to uh, uh, responsible uh, internationalization and uh, inclusion, of course. Um, so the, the department has really promoted uh, this, this kind of uh, innovative teaching. Uh, but the department uh, has also hosted uh, uh, from uh, 2019 uh, uh, to 2022 uh, three frightened scholars uh, from different countries, uh, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and uh, uh, within, uh, uh, well, the, the stays was uh, promoted within uh, the framework of a scholar's service, but also beyond this framework. And uh, within the framework, uh, within the scholar's service framework, uh, um, we have, uh, we have um, uh, uh, promoted uh, uh, seminar series that gives voice to certain uh, academics, uh, but also that um, fosters their inclusion in our academic context. And uh, um, just here, within the framework of this conference, uh, I've been told that yesterday um, the training seminars uh, have been, uh, uh, have started. Uh, so um, this is another very important uh, uh, action in order to promote the inclusion of uh, um, certain academics. And uh, so let me say that I, I am very proud uh, that the, the, the department I represent uh, uh, had uh, um, a, well, a, a, a kickoff role in these uh, initiatives uh, and uh, in uh, um, uh, activate uh, the scholars at risk uh, initiatives uh, in, uh, in Italy. And uh, uh, it was very uh, important in mm, shaping the commitment uh, of the University of Padua within uh, uh, the Scholars at Risk network uh, in Italy. And uh, let me say that uh, I don't think that uh, the time Claudia and Francesca dedicated to this enterprise uh, uh, has been stolen to the department needs or aims or purposes because uh, um, since the department uh, thinks or well, is very, very much convinced that uh, academic freedom uh, it has to be a, a practice uh, very important in order to foster uh, not only um, human rights, academic freedom, but let me say uh, an empowering right, because you know, um, academic freedom, uh, in a way, is a, a, a special phase uh, of uh, freedom of thought and freedom of expression. But on the other side, uh, academic freedom is also a, a, freedom, a, a right that makes it possible uh, uh, to have uh, freedom of expression and freedom of thought, uh, basically. 
So it is very important uh, to, uh, to shift uh, um, theoretical positions and, uh, and a theoretical uh, research into action uh, just because uh, we are talking about uh, a human right when we are uh, talking about uh, an empowering human rights and that make it, made it possible to have many other uh, human rights uh, uh, effective or protected. So I wish you a fruitful conference and um, I want to thank uh, all of you here and online and I, I, will, uh, I want to thank you uh, for your efforts in this kind of enterprise. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elena, <clears throat> also for, for highlighting from the very beginning that students are very much involved in these activities. For those of you who came to this uh, main hall uh, of the complex, uh, the Beato Pellegrino complex, you notice that in the aisle there are some posters, uh, manifestos that have been prepared by the students that have been working with us, and they will be talking about this even more. But of course, they contributed a lot also to making this space feel like this is a space for us to discuss and talk and act academic freedom. And so last but not least, of course, uh, Professor Luigi Baldo, Dean of the Department of Historical and Geographical Science, Geographic Sciences and the Ancient World. Uh, of course, uh, you played a prominent role uh, in uh, framing uh, the whole 800 year progress. Thank you, thank you very much, Claudia. Dear colleagues, Dear SAR members, dear students, as the head of the Department of Historical and Geographic Sciences and the Ancient World, it is a, with great pleasure that I welcome you as at this meeting at this meeting on spaces and practices of academic freedom. As a department, uh, we have been involved for years, both in historical and philological research, as well as in teaching activity. We are strongly engaged with promoting and supporting academic freedom in teaching and study, but also in speech and expression. On the last years, our department has especially supported, thanks also to the contribution of the university, several historical and philological research projects. Some of the results will be presented today in the special section on the volume Libertas between politics, religions, knowledge, edited by Andrea Carocausi, Paola Molino, and Dennis Solera. The volume has been the result of a multidisciplinary collaboration within our department that includes classical studies, modern and contemporary history. It highlights how the concept of Libertas, which is sometimes translated in a wrong way as freedom, uh, has undergone different conceptualization over the centuries. For instance, it is impossible to give a translation that takes into account the semantic complexity of the term. It is sufficient to recall how much in ancient Rome the word libertas had an ambiguous use. Libertas is in Rome a privilege and not a right. The great historian Ronald Sine emphasizes how it lends itself well to political intrigue and how people and categories who held power and wealth continually invoked libertas. In particular, in Western Europe, freedom has been the result of a historical process of affirmation, struggle, defense, and disputes over several rights. Freedom of the person, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, political and religious freedom, freedom of movement. The historical and philological research around the concept of libertas is linked to another research with the, within our department, the topic of mobility. Freedom of movement and freedom of circulation of ideas, just to name a few, are at the center of our research activities in the Center for Advanced Studies, Mobility and Humanities. It also includes relevant projects uh, on the analysis and reconstruction of students' migration from and to Padua over the centuries. These principles linked to academic freedom 
are then constantly practiced in our courses. I am referring especially to the international courses. Within the SGR, there are uh, three international courses, uh, the Erasmus Mundus uh, Technique Patrimoine Territoire de, de, de l'Industrie, the Master of Arts in Local Development, and finally, Mobility Studies. These courses welcome about 150 students per year, coming from all over the world, with their culture and aspirations. Our task to train critical minds is to train critical minds that are able to understand the world and to reflect also on academic freedom. Therefore, I thank the organizers of this meeting, uh, Professors Claudia Padovani and Francesca Helm, in particular for involving our departments in, the initial, in this initiative. As always, the collaboration between our departments proves to be fruitful, thanks to the colleagues, to the colleagues of this GEA, who participates in these days, and to international office of the University of Padova for supporting the organization of the workshop. Finally, I want to wish you all a great job for these days and a fruitful cooperation and exchange of ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bald. Thank you very much. Um, one of the, of the key words that came out of all our meetings yesterday uh, with the scholars that are hosted with us and also with students is this uh, theme of networking and networks uh, and the connections and how much we need connections in order to operate collegially um, to face uh, some of the challenges. So I take your words as an opportunity for us uh, to start from this collaboration and maybe do something together, particularly in relation to the activities we have with students. Uh, from next year, the seminar, uh, the Students Advocacy Seminar that Francesca and myself have run at SPIGI will be a general course, so it will be open to students from across the university. And it will be amazing to have students from different backgrounds with different competencies and skills that can participate in uh, developing activities uh, for academic freedom. So we look forward to having a longer conversation on this. Uh, so I would like to thank all um, the speakers. Uh, we're now almost ready to move into the first uh, session in this um, event. Uh, before we do this, uh, <coughs> I would like to give uh, just a few brief announcements. Um, so you've noticed that the program is uh, quite dense. Uh, we have several sessions. Uh, we start this morning with the launch of a book that is dedicated to the Libertas that was already mentioned. We will hear a lot more. We will hear from, some, from the editors, of course, and also um, from the person who's been uh, the ideator and in charge of the series of eight books to celebrate the 800 years uh, uh, anniversary, and we will hear from some of the authors. We have discussed together which chapters uh, we would have liked to invite here. Of course, the, the whole book is very relevant, but we thought that addressing some of the themes uh, that we will further discuss during the conference uh, in order to link uh, the historical reflection to some of the challenges that we're facing today, that was a good criteria, and so we look forward to this uh, first session. And then the afternoon is very much dedicated to the European context within which we work and operate for academic freedom. So as I already mentioned, uh, we will have a session that is more related to institutional approaches and commitment, and then a following session dedicated to how knowledge uh, is elaborated and produced and disseminated by those scholars, uh, like some of the scholars that uh, uh, we're honored to have here with us, uh, uh, manage to develop and create and produce uh, and share uh, uh, while they are uh, displaced uh, and sometimes hosted at our universities. Um, and then tomorrow, uh, the day is, uh, is mostly dedicated to addressing the, the topics uh, that our students have addressed, uh, but of course the students will be in conversation with institutional actors and other uh, uh, actors that are very relevant to the activities that we're carrying out. So we will see that afterwards. But in terms of uh, uh, just uh, housekeeping, so we will have lunch breaks here in the same complex in a, in a cloister, so we can just uh, follow uh, the thread as we go there. Uh, tonight, uh, after the last uh, session, we should be done by six uh, sharp, because we have organized a guided tour to the main building of the university. 
um, and the tour will be dedicated uh, to the theme of the Libertas. Uh, so some of the special places in that building or around that building uh, that marked uh, uh, the experience of uh, uh, Libertas uh, in, our, uh, in our university, followed up by uh, uh, coming together more of a collegial event uh, that we can have some drinks and food uh, together. I would also like to remind that uh, uh, this was not planned, but we take the opportunity um, there are uh, screenings of a movie that have been uh, created on the occasion of the celebration. The movie is titled La Forma della Memoria, so The Shape of Memory. It's dedicated to the 800 years. It's an amazing opportunity to learn more about the university, some of the prominent figures uh, that marked uh, also the Libertas in the university, and to see some of the spaces. And it's screened uh, every evening at 7 and at 9.15 in the ancient cloister of the main building. So very close uh, to where we will have uh, our uh, gathering. And you're all welcome to go. It's open to the public, uh, so you can just sit. They also have English translations, uh, so it's quite nice uh, as an opportunity to see. Uh, finally, uh, as you noticed, uh, or maybe we managed to take some arrangements uh, to make sure that uh, the safety uh, of all those who are in this uh, place uh, is guaranteed. Uh, so we managed to advise uh, the authorities, the universities, uh, the university has taken some uh, measure. We've asked uh, uh, not to take pictures uh, in some areas, uh, so we please ask uh, you all to respect this. And without further ado, I think we can move into the first session. So thanks a lot very much to the speakers. Um, thank you, Professor Baldo, Professor Pariotti. Thank you, Joel. You will, you will be again here on the table at some point. And I would like now to invite uh, uh, Professor Caracausi and Professor Molino to introduce uh, the book, and Professor Annalisa Oboe uh, to give a presentation of the series. Uh, and you will be chairing the session, so I just leave uh, the floor, the microphone, and everything. Okay, we are ready to start. Are we ready to start? Okay, it's on Zoom. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce and to chair this uh, session. First of all, I would like to thank so much Claudio Padovani and Francesca Helm for inviting us uh, to this uh, uh, book launch. This is the first time that we have the opportunity to present uh, to the public the, our book on Libertas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not all the authors uh, uh, have been involved uh, because of the large number of the authors, uh, but uh, uh, we will have also the time and the opportunity to mention them. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Annalisa Oboe for the presentation of the 800 Years book series on Patavina Libertas, in which uh, this book on uh, Libertas uh, is uh, um, placed. Annalisa Hoboe uh, from the University of Padua is a professor of English literature in the Department of Linguistic and Literary Studies of the university. Uh, she has promoted uh, postcolonial studies in Italy and uh, her research focuses uh, on postcolonial theory and cultures, uh, South African and Black Atlantic literatures. Australian indigenous writing and British colonial and contemporary literature. She has been a vice director for cultural, social, and gender relations at the University of Padua. And during uh, these, those years, uh, she coordinated uh, the uh, 800 years book series Patavina Libertas. Um, and uh, uh, I invite her to present uh, the collection. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I wish to say a few words uh, of thanks uh, for uh, this invitation. Uh, I really feel very honored to be invited to this uh, conference organized by Scholars at Risk Italy. 
uh, whose work of advocacy and networking uh, at the international level, I believe, is inviting us all to see what happens in higher education institutions around the world, uh, to see the risks uh, that scholars face in the, in the name of academic freedom. But SAR is also inviting us to act on what we see, uh, on the injustices and the violation of rights uh, locally and globally. So I really wish to thank uh, Claudia Padovani and Francesca Helm and all the people here in Padova, but also in Trento, who is actually working, who are working together um, for, for their energy and vision and also for, I would say, the practical daily work uh, that they do to help academics uh, to continue their work. So thank you. I wish, will you join me <laughs> in thanking them together? Okay, now um, I wish to start my uh, intervention on Patavina Libertas uh, with a rather commonplace remark. And the remark is that it is difficult to speak about freedom, to speak about freedom in the abstract as a concept or an idea, and this is a challenge that the book Patavina Libertas has actually uh, taken on seriously. Um, but I wish to suggest that uh, it is only when freedom is acted out and located, uh, when freedom comes to circumscribe a set of essentials for the here and now of a culture, an individual, a class, a society, that freedom can somehow speak and, and we can hear it. Um, so freedom really uh, presents itself in action in fact, produces itself in action. Um, and, um, and this reminds me of what uh, uh, the Strasbourg philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy used to say uh, about this. Um, he, it says that freedom produces itself in action in the same way as an actor, in order to be the actor that he is, produces himself on stage. So freedom exists when we play freedom, okay? Not either before or after. So I suggest we need to confront uh, freedom as a series of multiple and varied attempts at performing what in fact it may mean through experiences involving people, young people, women, scholars at risk, migrants, minority, asylum seekers, colonized or neo-colonized people, the garbage people and the disposable workers of globalized economies. Because there is no language of freedom, I would say, that is not underpinned by a language of rights, including, to begin with, the right to freedom itself. So this entanglement of freedom and rights is one of the central cultural, political, ethical, dilemmas of our times. Now, in the university, we're asking again what academic freedom is or might be, and I will take the liberty <laughs> to spell out by examples uh, what it has been for us in Padova, since freedom has been the core of our cultural identity since uh, its foundation in 1222. And this is are at 100 years and we celebrate it. So uh, you will forgive me if I just select a few examples uh, of w moments in which we see freedom in action in our history. Um, well, we see freedom in action when a group of students, young students and scholars leave the University of Bologna, um, move north to Vicenza first and then to Padua in search of uh, greater freedom of expression and uh, research. Um, so that's when uh, the university started. And because of this free beginning, uh, Padua attracted right from the 13th century uh, a number of scholars, students, uh, uh, intellectuals from many different parts of Europe. 
So um, we uh, saw in Padua four different groups, right, 40 years after its foundation, there were four different nazioni's so-called here in Padova. Uh, Germany, France, Proven Pro province, and, and uh, someone else, sorry, I forget now, but it, just to say that um, it was a very new thing coming into being, and we can say that in medieval time in the 13th century in Padova, uh, Europe somehow already existed before even its idea started to become, you know, commonplace or shared. Um, and then uh, we, we came under the rule of the Republic of Venice. The university became the University of La Serenissima, um, which uh, granted uh, this uh, exercise of, of freedom um, uh, protection from the repressive policies of the counter-reformation. And uh, on several occasions, it hosted professors from other naciones that were suspected of heresy or considered unbelievers. Um, and religious freedom was practically uh, one of the granted rights. Uh, there were Protestants, there were uh, Jews and, and other uh, confessions, uh, uh, students and and professors could actually study and teach and do research freely without a professor fide as that was required, a profession of adherence to uh, Christianity and the Catholic Church that was required in other parts of Italy. And um, another moment in which we can see freedom in action is when uh, Galileo Galilei, the great scientist that everyone knows globally because he was the um, uh, proponent in, uh, of the scientific method, which we still follow in our research today. Um, uh, he, sp uh, he spent uh, in Padua a long time, and when he decided finally to go back to Tuscany, he regretted it because um, his story does not end well. He was not granted the same freedom that he had in Padua to research and, and do groundbreaking work for the future. So he, he said that in Padua he spent the best 18 years of, of his life. And then um, I, I want to remark, because this is very dear to my heart, that uh, Padua also holds a special place uh, in the history of the relationship between women and uh, scientific institutions. Um, in 1678, uh, when in the rest of Italy and in Europe, uh, academic institutions, centers of research were for male only, um, a young woman from Venice called Elena Lucrezia Cornaro Piscopia uh, was welcomed inside uh, the Padua academic community and granted a doctoral degree in philosophy. She was the first woman in the modern world that we know of ever to be granted an academic degree. And today, Elena for us is a special icon. Uh, it is celebrated, uh, she is celebrated as an extraordinary example of uh, um, intellectual power. Uh, but also as an early symbol of um, social recognition of a woman's capacity to think and to know. And then uh, I want to stress moving forward in, in the centuries uh, uh, that uh, Padua has always had uh, political freedom as part of its academic freedom. I mean, you cannot uh, be uh, a, a, a higher education institution in a world of oppression, in a world of dictatorship, in a world of uh, injustice. And so um, freedom from foreign oppression was the kind of freedom that the students here exercised in uh, uh, February 1948 when they uh, helped um, they joined the battle against the uh, Austrian uh, uh, powers that, that occupied our region. And then during the, the Risorgimento, for example, they joined uh, uh, the First War of Independence and Garibaldi's expedition of the thousands uh, to, to free uh, Italy and make it one country. 
Um, and then uh, Padua's freedom paid a high price uh, in human lives in the struggle against Nazism and fascism in, in the Second World War. Um, and, and we got a gold medal for that, the only Italian university to get that. I mean, uh, it, it seems, you know, uh, strange to get a gold medal for going to war, but in this case, we uh, actually um, saw the bravery of our students and our uh, rector, Concetto Marchesi, a great humanist, who actually said we cannot work as a university if we don't join the resistance to Nazi fascism, and that's what we uh, did. So, um, the Patavina Libertas, that is in, in the motto of the University of Padua, um, represents not just an abstract invocation of freedom, but uh, a freedom that it was coherently practiced for eight centuries of uninterrupted history. Um, as mentioned, uh, we, um, we define, we qualify this freedom in many different ways. Uh, as a, uh, the freedom to move of people of ideas, freedom of expression, open debate, religious freedom, freedom of thought, political freedom, freedom of research, academic freedom, and all round freedom. And our world, I think, seems to need more and more the shared secular values of freedom, acceptance of diversity and peaceful living in common with ourselves and, and the planet. This is the kind of legacy that we are handing over to the new uh, generations of our ninth uh, century of history. And you will find out much more by digging into this book that will be presented and discussed this morning. Um, for me, uh, one of the most exciting initiatives we planned for the 800 years uh, of celebration uh, here in Padova um, was revisiting, revising, revisiting, rewriting our history, long history. And it turned out that we uh, actually completed a nine volume series called Patavina Libertas, a European history of the University of Padua, which um, s helped us to trace and highlight the international dimension that was its own specific feature uh, since uh, its foundation. So freedom and Europe um, are the horizons which we must not and will not forsake, and we are, we are, which are indeed a beautiful legacy, I think, uh, for the generations to come. The series itself um, is the, results, uh, re the result of a complex work of sharing uh, historical and cultural approaches and perspectives, research proposals uh, based on um, solid archival research, uh, presented by the centers and the departments, some centers and some departments, or some of uh, them are here today, in the, represented by their uh, deans. Um, and, and we started, of the university of course, and the, um, we started in 2017. So uh, it was a five year long work, uh, which is now completed. And uh, we, we must say we're very happy with it. Uh, it was our uh, aim uh, to produce uh, captivating and highly readable texts, books, uh, for a wide audience, not necessarily academic, not necessarily specialized uh, historians, um, but volumes that were for a wide public, but also authoritative and innovative. Um, I would like you to give, uh, I would like to give you an idea of the lines of investigations that we followed in, um, that we follow in the nine volumes. Um, uh, according to the work plan uh, of Patavina Liberta, um, and these nine volumes are basically distributed into two blocks, two parts, uh, even if there are very important connections and references across the nine volumes. The first part is dedicated to freedom as a theme and founding value of the university, um, um, sought and practiced in research, study, exchange of people, mobility, knowledge, research, teaching practices within a scientific, um, academic, cultural, and political context, which is continental 
and eighth century long. The second part of the work focuses on scientific disciplinary mac macro areas, of which the four uh, volumes trace the origins, developments, and important contributions, without neglecting the dark moments uh, in our history, because there were moments when nothing happened. Um, uh, and this, uh, so we see uh, these disciplines in the local, the national, and the international contexts. So the four books are dedicated, one to philosophy and literature, one to the arts and architecture, the third uh, to science and technology, and the last to the medical arts. Unfortunately, the volume volumes are in Italian, but we hope we will be able to translate some of this work into English for an international readerships, in readership so that um, the academic freedom that we practiced here may travel and possibly fertilize not only our future, but also yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annalisa, for this uh, introduction uh, to uh, the book series. And uh, uh, now we move to the book, uh, to the book Liberta, Libertas between religion, politics, and knowledge. As uh, um, Annalisa has already told, uh, this uh, has been a very long uh, project, uh, five years, uh, in which also the COVID uh, limited our possibility to do research in archives and libraries where our research uh, is uh, currently uh, doing. And uh, this book has been the result of the collaboration uh, between disciplines and authors uh, coming from Italy, but also from other parts of the world. Uh, 15 people, uh, I would like to mention them, uh, Giulia Albanese, Antonella Barzazzi, Luca Beltramini, Paola Findlen, Enrico Francia, Cin uh, uh, Cinzia Klestinek, Margherita Losacco, Adriano Mansi, uh, Anna Marcus, uh, Andrea Martini, Guglielmo Monetti, Denis Solera and Michela Valente. Uh, this book has been uh, coordinated by myself, Paola Molina and Denis Solera, and uh, it collects, uh, as I told, um, different disciplines, uh, so philologists, uh, historians, uh, historians of science, uh, and uh, different perspectives on the topic of uh, uh, libertas. Um, we will now introduce this volume. Uh, Paola Molino will introduce uh, the volume. Uh, Paola is an associate professor in early modern history in this university. She holds a PhD in history and civilization from the European University Institute. She published the book on the creation of the Imperial Library in Vienna in 2017, uh, L'Impero di Carta, History of a Library and a Bibliothecarian, 1575-68. Uh, uh, she worked in Vienna and Munich before joining in Padua University. He, her current project is about library catalogs in a global perspective, and she now will introduce our book. Thank you, Andrea. There is a PowerPoint also on the desktop. So good morning, uh, and uh, thank you, um, everybody, for, for being here, and thank you also, Claudia and Francesca, for involving us in this project, and also with it was not only a conference, it was also an attempt uh, we have made together uh, to uh, join forces on this topic of the academic freedom. But uh, let's say this is also a possibility for us uh, to connect the work that we have done on a historical basis uh, and connect it to a reflection that uh, has implications today. So, Mainly, this is for us uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to tell you what we have thought about while writing the book and how we have challenged this idea of the Pasavina Libertas and of academic freedom. So I shall thank you very much, Annalisa, for also this let's say, historical introduction that uh, leads, us, leads us to the main question of whether was there anything to write about this Patavina Libertas, to this uh, idea of freedom that has underpinned uh, this so long history of, uh, of the university. We have heard already this morning and uh, um, in the presentation and now in the introduction, the extent to which in universities like in the civil society, the idea of freedom is so linked 
to the, to the <laughs> acknowledgement of rights, the rights of men and women, and there is no freedom, we can say, in the contemporary world that is not the result of historical processes of struggle for defense of questionings, questioning of the rights associated with it. The freedom of the person, the freedom of thought of expression, and Elisa has just mentioned this, the political and religious freedom, the freedom of movement. This morning, uh, our director Gianluigi spoke about our project on mobility, in which we have reflected so much about the possibility, but the hindrances of uh, the movement of people in the past and in the present. So in Europe, this idea of freedom has an history, and it's a long one. It's a history that maybe we can say found its climax with the revolution starting from the 17th century in England, then in the 18th century in France, and then over the Atlantic in the United States of America. So this idea of freedom as connected to rights. It was a time, the 18th century, in which uh, institutional responses were produced to generalize the motions that uh, had run uh, through the European society throughout the entire early modern time, since the Renaissance, like the emergence of a disgust towards coercion, such as torture, slavery, or the need that the right of people all over the earth were recognized, so the political rights of all citizens in all, in all nations. So these were all feeling that rose from uh, the constant connection of Europe with the rest of the world, but also the, the process of institutionalization uh, in Europe, the Europe, the reorganization of society, the secularization of society. These were all processes that happened in this early modern time. In particular, it was the global circulation of ideas that had a decisive impact uh, in Europe through, for instance, the development of the periodical press, the writing of novels, the writing of private letters, the real or imaginary travel reports. This, all, this factor have contributed not only to a comparative and connected reflection on freedom on a global level, but also they have contributed to make, it, make Europe ridiculous, to make uh, Europe, to, to make all the contradictions of the European society evident. Here you have just two examples. One is one of the most successful epistolary novel in 18th century Europe, Montesquieu Persian Letters. This is a, um, a collection of letters written by an imaginary travel from the Safavid Empire, Persia, today Iran, that observed, it's fiction, okay? It's, <laughs> that observed uh, France during the time of Louis XIV, sometimes fascinated, sometimes critical, a critical observation of the European habits in politics, in religion, and so on. The second examples you have here is of a few years earlier. It's a woman, Margaret Cavendish, it, this is a utopian fantastic tale, the description of the new world called the, bla called the blazing world. Here, the author uh, compared an imaginable, imaginary possible words with the real one in which women were not allowed to access power. But in this imaginary world, women were indeed allowed. So between the 19th and the 20th century in, uh, in Europe, there were, no, by the throne. Yeah. So this was the beginning, but then European history has had many moments of reflection on freedom also afterward as the result of the struggle of rights, the war of independence, the end of World War II, the decolonization process. Why I'm telling you all this if we are here to talk about University of Padua? Because of course, and Ponderanti, in this long historical process, is it legitimate to wonder how a university 
and in particular one of the oldest universities in Western Europe, has contributed to the development of this very idea of freedom associated with the rights of a person. And the question is even more legitimate for the University of Padua that, as uh, also Annalisa was, uh, and, and also um, uh, Claudia this morning, as, as uh, reminded us, a university like that of Padova that has expressed now for many years in its motto, the universality of freedom uh, linked to the making and the dissemination of, of knowledge. Which I mostly. In fact, the question about the meaning and the persistence of this motto, Universa Universis Patavina Libertas, has been present and of course alive in the volume that we are presenting today. Uh, but we have to admit that this question was not uh, uh, our major concern uh, when uh, uh, we collected and we conceived uh, the volume and then we have also um, discussed the articles with our author. The motto was much more for us a trigger for a critical rethinking of this libertas, of this freedom. For histo as historians, for us, this could not be otherwise, because if the idea of the Patavina Libertas, in its very different political, institutional, and philosophical declinations, emerges clearly in the sources, emerges clearly at different stages of this discontinuous life of the university, the motto appear as such in a time in which neither in Padua nor in Italy and not so much in Europe, academic freedom and freedom as a whole was uh, a, a central topic. It was the fascist rector Carlo Anti in December 1939 on the occasion of the inauguration of uh, the beautiful Sala dei Giganti annexed to the Liviano uh, Palace that uh, inaugurated this motto when he began his speech with this word. Universa Universis Patavina Libertas has been the seal of our university over the centuries. Born in the distant uh, 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 12th century out of need for freedom, his existence next to, the, next to the oldest university of Bologna was justified by its freedom, its flowering, its glory, first promised by Venice, then by the new Italy, and were the, fruit of this, that were the fruits of the same freedom. Not only before this date, there is no mention of the universality of the Patavina Libertas, but in December 1938, Anti appealed to it to provide an interpretative key in the name of continuity. To do this, he distanced himself for the historical traditional interpretation according to which the transition of the city of Padua in 1405 from a free city to a city belonging to the Republic of Venice has uh, distorted and also challenged, of course, its uh, uh, libertarian character. Padua was a free city before and uh, it had been chosen also by the students for being uh, a city not subjected to any prince in the, uh, at the beginning, and he anti proposes an explicit relationship between the power of Venice in the past and the power of, a st of the states, the fascist states in its present. This relationship was emphasized above all when it took up the characteristics of a libertas patavina that he described as a disciplinary something connected to discipline, typical of Padua, he says. Freedom of speculation, freedom of scientific research, freedom of teaching, three aspects of the same position, which even in the very strict Vene Veneto state, as in ours, finds the right and necessary limit in the responsibility of the teacher, in the conscience of the citizen, who feels a living part of the state, a discipline soldier of a national idea. Universal, therefore, 
not because unlimited, but because able to involve all fields of knowledge and learning. Now, in a report presented a few months earlier, ANTI had already introduced a limitation to the universality of the Patavina Libertas when he proposed the distinction between a presumed freedom which translates into effective license, and with, li with license he understands that everybody can do and say what he or she wants in, in uh, easier terms, and the freedom of thought and studies, freedom that in all times has been and always is guaranteed to teachers and pupils with the only limit being what cautions itself must impose on the citizen. Now, he continued then his, uh, uh, his explanation by connecting then this Patavina Libertas to many other examples of prudence and temperance that there were at the University of Padua throughout the centuries. He's, he writes, it's, it is not too audacious to recognize precisely in this Patavina Libertas one of the reasons why from our university, universally known as the heart of political and scientific unscrupulousness, so many heroes of the faith, doctor of the church, many and tempered by the ardent, goliardic and scientific life of Padua, did they build the miracle of their life of faith and battle of this experience. So why is saying that, Auntie? Annalisa before has spoken about Galileo Galilei, about many, let's say, genius of the Patavina Libertas. So Auntie there has to negotiate between a past of uh, people that have struggled for another kind of Libertas challenging the authority, and one he was going to uh, claim in this very moment. Now, this is not the, claim, the moment to go on on this history, but, uh, uh, and nor we wanted in our volume to give too much credit to a fascist motto, conceptualized according to the rhetoric of an era in which, when it spoke of freedom, necessarily had to do so with a series of clarification, distinction, negotiation. Yet, Antis' formulation of the motto that we still use today is an extreme interpretation. It's the extreme of inter interpretation of a feeling that over the centuries has gone through the evolution of the University of Padua, so that even the fascist rector had to negotiate with it. Over time, men and women engage in the process of organization and dissemination of knowledge have formulated in Padova their activities in the university classrooms or despite the university classrooms or around this very classroom in terms of research and affirmation of asymmetrical forms of libertas that very often implied not inclusion but exclusion. This exclusion could be economical, could be social, could be confessional, could be political. There are indeed gigantic differences between the idea of libertas claimed by Galileo Galilei, as Annalisa was mentioning, and uh, uh, here you find an example of a friend of Galileo Galilei writing to the philosopher Cesare Cremonini, saying, oh, quanto avrebbe fatto bene il signor Galileo a non entrare in queste girandole, it means to do have been a good idea not to start all these disquisitions on astronomy and not to leave the, pata, the libertà patavina, the Paduan freedom. Of course, there is a difference between this claim and that of Concetto Marchesi, if you go at the end of World War II, when he calls students to give a new sense to this idea of freedom. Studi students, he says, I leave you with the hope of returning to you teacher and comrade after the fraternity of a struggle fought together. For the faith that enlightens you, for the indignation that outrages you, do not let the oppressor dispose of your life. Resurrect your battalions, free Italy from slavery and ignominy, and add glory to the standard of your university. 
add a greater new decoration in this supreme battle for justice and peace in the world. So here we are in 19, 1943, and here Marchesi called the students of Padua to protect that freedom, to join the resistance and fight against fascism. Now, there is one main difference about, between Galileo and Concetto Marchesi. For Gal the libertas, the freedom of Galileo, as we have heard, is a privilege for a few. That of Marchesi is a right to struggle for. Considering these crucial differences, the principle that guide the collection of the contribution that we present today was precisely the search for these appropriations, for this interpretation. Annalisa was using the word for these performances of the Patavina Libertas by men and women who from the Renaissance until today have lived and animated the concrete spaces and the academic life in Padua. So we know, we are aware that many of them has used this word in ways we do not acknowledge as freedom today. Nor with the volume we want it to be exhaustive, like collecting a libertas over the century. We collected a few moments, a few speeches, a few places in which the appeal to these libertas was raised in the classrooms, in centers, in the libraries of the university. So what is revealed in, the, in this volume is not a long narrative, but are the ambiguity, ambiguities, the contradictions, and also the power of a concept whose meanings derive from the experiences of men and women in this specific spatial, social, and political context. Practicing libertas and giving it institutional form at the University of Padua, from the foundation of the botanical garden to that of the anatomical theater, and until the foundation of the Center of, for Human Rights in the 80s of the 20th century, has undoubtedly assumed many and multifaceted meaning. So we have tried to emphasize in the volume practices, conflicts, and tensions. And there is a part of the volume, part of three and four, that are explicitly devoted to conflicts and tensions. But also there is a first part on the very concept of, of, of uh, libertas. This is part one. And there is also part on the institutions. Although we believe that the, pro the presence of uh, specific places of knowledge alone do not explain the success of this formula over the century, nor can the political events of the city of Padua explain it as such. As we shall see, beyond these structures, there were people that embodied the structures and gave to such idea of freedom different interpretations, more or less acceptable for us today and more or less acceptable even in the past. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paola, for this introduction to our volume. Uh, now we have some uh, um, authors in the volume that uh, will present some specific themes uh, uh, that Paola and also Annalisa has already introduced us. Uh, I would like to invite, uh, first of all, Anna Marcus uh, from Harvard University to join here. Anna Marcus, uh, he is. Uh, do you have a presentation? Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe while Anna is uh, uploading her presentation, just a few words about the selection we have done. Because uh, you will find there, there are some copies of the volume. The volume, as Andrea was saying, comprised many different articles. And uh, uh, there was, let's say, an attempt to tackle some of the historical topic. Um, and we asked colleagues to think a topic they study already under the lens of these libertas. After that, we have asked some of them to come here today and 
redo the exercise that they have done in the volume. So things, think at their topic under the umbrella of the, of the Liberta. So the first, Anna, she's a, speci a specialist of book censorship and her chapter is about censorship of, book, of books. And uh, we, as, as a wall, let's say, we have asked three colleagues of being there today. And uh, we hope it can work. <laughs> okay, um, Anna Marcus, uh, uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, History of Science uh, at Harvard University. Uh, her research focuses on the scientific culture of early modern Europe, uh, and her first book, uh, uh, Forbidden Knowledge, uh, Medicine, Science, and Censorship in Early Modern Italy, has been published by um, the University of Chicago Press in 2020. Uh, she explores uh, the censorship of medical books uh, from their proliferation in print uh, through uh, uh, the prohibition placed on many of these texts uh, during the Counter-Reformation. Uh, currently, she is writing a book with Paula Finlen, another author of our collection, uh, who is unfortunately, uh, she has not been able to join here, about Galileo's correspondence uh, called uh, uh, Galileo's Letters, uh, Experiments in Friendships, uh, which grows out of their collaboration on the Galileo Correspondence Project. Today, she will present uh, the chapter on censorship uh, in uh, uh, early modern Italy with a particular focus uh, on Padua and Venice. Okay. Good morning. Thank you all. It's such a pleasure to be here to celebrate uh, all of you and also the 800th anniversary of the University of Padua. As Andrea said, I am a scholar of early modern science and medicine, the history of the body, uh, religious culture, and especially book censorship. So I'm gonna talk today a little bit about less uh, libertas and more restrictions on libertas for scholars who came to the University of Padua. And I wanna give us a sense as we reflect on the long history here of uh, ways in which people have courageously stood up against systems of censorship also in a, in a long historical approach. So first, a couple of comments about censorship uh, around 1559 when the, the papacy issued its first papal index of forbidden books following the Reformation. I want us to understand that censorship in the middle of the 16th century uh, shares some similarities, of course, with censorship today, but also some major and important differences that I want you to grasp. Um, one of those major differences is that censorship in the 16th century was not secret. That is, today, I think in, in many places, especially when we think about censorship and secrecy in the United States, we don't even know the extent to which we are the knowledge of, of the knowledge that we are missing. That is, there is so much that we do not have access to. We, we, censorship may be there and we can't always see it. That is not the case in the 16th century. Censorship is very much a part of every European culture, and especially Catholic culture in Italy after the Reformation. When the index of prohibited books, an example of which I've shown here, when the index of prohibited books is published, that doesn't just mean that it's printed, it means that it's read aloud at pulpits, right? Read aloud from churches and nailed to the doors of cathedrals. People are well aware that they are operating in a place uh, where freedom, where libertas, 
freedom of thought is restricted. Additionally, censorship is often thought about in relation to ideas, right? Heliocentrism, right? Um, methods of salvation. Censorship is not only about ideas, though. Censorship is also about regulating the people who are able to espouse them at different times and places. So we might think about the ways that ideas and people get conflated and flattened in a long history, such that we have Leonhard Fuchs here, who's an important Lutheran um, physician. Uh, he's holding a plant here. Next time you see something, we have a little bit of fuchsia, um, a bright pink shirt, right? That's named after Leonhard Fuchs. Um, really important person in the history of medicine who is censored not because his pl the books of plants that he publishes are problematic, they are books of plants, but because he himself is Lutheran. That is, in order for his books then to circulate in Padova in the 16th century, his name is blacked out, is obscured, his face is even crossed out of this one, right? This is about people in addition to being about ideas. People are always having ideas. Finally, I want us to um, nuance slightly our ideas about um, how censorship operates. That is, the censorship doesn't necessarily make something a text, an idea, immediately unavailable, right? It doesn't take it away immediately. It changes the ways that people are able to access knowledge, the ways that people are able to express themselves. And I want us to be attentive to that. That is, to give an example, again, from the, uh, this is the early 17th century, in order to have a prohibited book, you had to request a license in order to be able to read it. So that is, the books are prohibited, but there are also structures in place to allow scholars to be able to continue using these ideas, but in circumscribed ways. So I just want us to think about how complicated uh, it was in the past to be a scholar, in addition to thinking about how complicated it can be now to be a scholar in the world in which we live in today. So that is to give a slightly um, simplified uh, dynamic here. I want us to think about the fact that there was forbidden knowledge and the fact that there was Catholic knowledge and to bring those two realms together to think about the ways in which knowledge could be both forbidden, both prohibited, and also potentially allowed to circulate within the ambit of the Catholic world also. So to give a couple of famous examples from the history of the University of Padova, we might think about Andrea Viz uh, Andreas Vesalius' book on the fabric of the human body about dissection, which in many copies, although not this one, uh, was censored because the, uh, the printer, Johannes Operinus, was Protestant. So again, I'm gonna censor it. But there are lots of copies out there, just none of them that I had pictures of on my computer. So censored copies. Additionally, you might find as a medical student in the 16th or 17th century that the copy of Leonhard Fuchs's work on medical paradoxes, the medical text that you were learning from had pages blacked out of it. That this is how people are operating and learning. So that even though when we think about libertas, right, in at liberty, freedoms at the University of Padua, we also have to understand the ways that those were historically circumscribed, historically limited <clears throat> through Catholic censorship. Uh, to give you a sense again of how that was, <clears throat> how that was repeatedly visible for people, we can see that people would have uh, been engaging with books, with medical books, uh, which is my area of expertise, in copies that had names cut out of them, names blacked out of them, where even the way that they were sitting on the shelves indicated immediately that the knowledge in them was somehow circumspect, uh, circumscribed, somehow prohibited, somehow potentially dangerous. And I want us to realize the fact that even when people are thinking freely and widely that they're doing so within constraints. So then as we think about 
the 800th um, anniversary of the University of Padua, I want us to think a little bit about some of um, the examples of ways that people have resisted censorship regimes also, um, and, and ways that that has happened here at Padova. So one of the examples uh, that I like to talk about is, as, as uh, I pointed out here with this image, right? How does, how does somebody know that this is the part of the book that you have to cross out, that this is the part that has to go? And that actually takes an enormous amount of work, reading all of these books, figuring out which parts align with Catholic orthodoxy and which parts are problematic or even heretical. Um, and that's a work that the Catholic Church tried to enlist the professors at the University of Padua to do for them. Uh, which in the turn of the 16th century, they asked them to do the work, they called it the Honorata Impresa, the honorable enterprise of censoring books, to which the university professors here at Padova said, in short, no thank you. Um, they refused to hand over their copies of books, they said they didn't have access to them, they did, they said they had meetings at times that allowed, didn't allow them to do this work, that it was an impossible and never-ending project. There are ways in which they gathered in, to show support, but that then they, they actually never did the work of censoring the book. So we might think about this as part of our legacy of resistance to censorship, the ways in which the professors at the Cosmopolitan University of Padua uh, pumped the brakes on a project of censorship that the Catholic Church wanted them to undertake. I would also like to introduce you briefly to one of my favorite characters uh, in the history of Padova, uh, er Camilla Erculiani. She was an apothecary, um, so a pharmacist, who lived in Padua in the second half of the 16th century. She wrote here uh, the Lettere di Filosofia Naturale, the Letters on Natural Philosophy, this is the first work of natural philosophy, the, so the first science book written by a woman to be printed. Uh, and it's printed in Krakow, in Poland, um, by colleagues of hers that she met through her pharmacy, uh, but who were circulating through the University of Padua. And in this book, uh, she argues, when we think about free thought at the University of Padua, and also free thought of a woman, of a woman who is not university educated. This is 100 years before Elena Cornaro Piscopia. This is, um, she is not, she does not speak Latin. Her Italian is a little clunky, honestly. Um, so she is not a learned scholar, and yet she sees herself as able to speak, to speak in the realm of scholars and to publish her own work. Uh, I would, I will hazard that this story probably for her ideas did not have a happy ending, though like many stories of people who are not noble or famous, it's very difficult to track down exactly what happened. We know that the ideas that she puts forward in this book about the, the science of the flood, the natural philosophy of the, the biblical flood um, did not align with Catholic doctrine and she was put, there was a, a case brought before the Paduan Inquisition. Um, in the end, she was dismissed. Uh, she was determined to be not capable of thinking fully for herself as a woman, um, that like a child, she could not be held responsible for her thoughts. Um, and we don't know what happened beyond that. There are only two surviving copies of this book. I suspect that many of them were destroyed. Um, and that's why we don't have a long, one of the reasons uh, why we think that this book had, didn't, wasn't able to circulate widely. So that is, in some respects, she is a victim of censorship. Although I'd also suggest that we might think of her when we think of our history and our present engagement here at the University of Padua, that we might think of her as one of our intellectual ancestors. That is, that when I was visiting um, at the at the uh, at the Palazzo del Bo yesterday, and as you will this evening, um, I was reflecting, of course, on someone like Galileo and his incredible um, sacrifices. Um, 
But additionally, I was thinking about Camilla and the ways in which many, many people who have come into contact with the University of Padua, with the phenomenal intellectual climate here that has been thriving for 800 years, um, had both opportunities to speak freely, but also had to work within constraints. And so I want to appreciate the courage of people like Camilla Erculiani, like Galileo Galilei, like all of you who are here today, uh, as we think about the future of the university and of Libertas Patavina. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to you, uh, Anna, and uh, for this uh, wonderful picture of uh, censorship and the limits of uh, academic freedom and libertas uh, in early modern Padua. Now we move to uh, uh, Cinzia Klestinek, who is online, I think. Uh, Cindy, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm oh. here, yeah. Um, I have a PowerPoint also. Yeah. Um, uh, now I make you cost just a second. Where is? Mm -hmm. Where is Cinzia? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Should I s share my screen? Okay, I think that you are now co-host and you can share uh, your PowerPoint. Uh, so, uh, Cinzia Klestinek, uh, she is Associate Professor at Miami University in Ohio. Uh, she's, uh, focus, uh, her research focuses uh, on the history of science and medicine, the history of anatomy and dissections, and conception of bodily practices uh, related to health in the early modern period. In particular, she works uh, with sources and archives here in Venice, where she recently co-authored with uh, Gabriele Mattino an exhibition on art, medicine, and faith in the age of uh, Tintoretto at the Scuola Grande di San Marco. Uh, her, research, her new research focuses on the history of surgery, uh, which is often left from out of the history of medicine in the early modern period. Uh, from uh, mat the archival material, uh, she is attempting to understand how surgery made use of fields and kinds of knowledge that were uh, related to medicine. Uh, she will uh, talk us about uh, the new uh, sciences that uh, over the early modern period uh, were practices at, at the University of Padua. So please, uh, Cinzia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's early here, so I apologize if I'm a little um, sleepy. And also, uh, I'm sorry not to be there in person. Um, okay, is everything clear? Because I can't see you, but... Okay, all right, great. I just have um, uh, some few points to make that came from the chapter that I, um, that I submitted for the volume. So I just begin here. Um, so in the 16th century, amidst scholarly developments in humanism and also political ones related to the Counter-Reformation, which we just heard a lot about from Hannah, the scale uh, often tilted in the way of control and regulation rather than freedom. So my work is also really interested in um, in critiques of this notion of freedom, academic freedom. For students and scholars of medicine, humanism was associated with inquiry that extended from texts to the world itself, to gardens for the study of plants and to human and animal bodies for the study of anatomy or more generally health. In Padua, the Orto Botanico was constructed in 1545 and the anatomical theaters, there were several, in the decades that followed. So for scholars engaged in medical humanism, they enjoyed a level of cultural prestige or privilege associated with higher education and learning. At the same time, medical humanism initiated new modes of inquiry and investigation, creating, in other words, conditions that were conducive to libertas, to freedom. The sociological context of the university, however, qualified libertas in important ways. So these are the constraints. In the multicultural and multilingual setting of the university, freedoms coexisted uneasily with restraint, control, and sometimes coercion. 
So my essay explored these complications at the University of Padua, working backwards from the freedoms associated with postgraduate medical practitioners who practiced in nearby Venice, um, to those of medical students at the famous studio during the 16th century. Postgraduates embraced a humanist program and were protected by it because it signaled an elite status, in part because it signaled an elite status. But the same was not true for medical students. These students were introduced to medical humanism, initiated into its methods, but their learning was also set within the culture of the culture of the university, where libertas was unevenly distributed across the landscape of the student body. The study of medicine was founded on the idea that the best physician was also a philosopher. And in some cases, uh, physicians or students of medicine claimed to be truth seekers, even if those truths were found in unorthodox ways or even in heterodox traditions. Among these respected physicians was one uh, person called Agostino Gadolvino, a humanist involved in the translation of Galen's works in the time period. He became prior of the College of Physicians too. He was well-connected in Venice, but in 1557, he faced the Inquisition. As Alessandro Cellati has explained, uh, Gadaldino was asked about his religious views and he claimed, quote, that as a man of culture, Cindy, he was sorry. a curious person. And as such, he did not expect that questioning the faith, questioning Catholicism was sinful. Indeed, in front of the Inquisition, he went on um, that he had questioned the Pope's authority, the necessity to pray to the saints, the real presence of the body of Christ in the Eucharist, and the feasibility of the chastity vow. Gadaldino was not alone in making these kinds of defenses. In the second half of the 16th century, as the political climate of Venice began to shift and the Catholic Church extended its jurisdiction, many physicians were called before the Inquisition. Alessandro Cellati has studied how these physicians were embroiled in these contestations, and the Inquisition was carefully and consistently keeping track of physicians that lived and worked in Venice. Um, the Inquisition was concerned that physicians were failing to recommend confession to their dying patients and that they were using their position to promote heterodox views. Gadaldino's explanation to the Inquisition emphasizes the extent to which the methods of critical philological study of medicine, so humanism, uh, could be applied to other texts and traditions, including those of religion. He, like his colleagues, participated in a humanist culture that was engaged in a widespread restoration of ancient texts and traditions. But as Alessandro Cellati has added, he, like his colleagues, participated in the College of Physicians, a collective which offered protection to physicians from the Inquisition and its regulatory reach. If these were some of the necessary conditions for libertas, liberty, uh, uh, freedom in one's postgraduate professional career, they could hardly be met at the university where students were being introduced to the textual methods of humanism and where students were part of very different collectives. The setting of the university as we know was multicultural to be sure, but the dynamics within it uh, produced a different landscape, I think for libertas, for academic freedom. During the 16th century, many students came to Padua in order to study medicine, and they participated in the renewed interest in botany and anatomy. Medical humanism included the recovery of ancient texts or herbal or pharmacological medicine, what was called Materia Medica, and this included especially uh, Dioscorides' De Materia Medica. His text, along with Galen's work on simples, were taught in courses on medical botany at the university. In these courses, students would have encountered publications that were increasingly packed with information, um, such as the Leonard Fuchs uh, edition that uh, Hannah Marcus just um, showed us. 
The broad goal of these publications was to provide in part a comprehensive catalog of nature with distinctions between plants, between structures, between stages of development and growth. These catalogs were a precursor to the development of taxonomies and even to the, the development of the field of botany per se. Students combined this textual tradition with the study of plants in a garden. Exercising their privilege, in this case to be assertive, students petitioned to have the botanical garden constructed uh, a little before 1545 on the grounds uh, that it would enable them to learn more about Materia Medica and learn more quickly. They also suggested that the garden would help to maintain Padua's reputation as an exceptional institution and to be useful in, rec in recruiting more students. Venice funded this request and the decree establishing it reiterated the practical aim of the renewed interest in botany, namely that existing errors in pharmacy would be diminished and lives would be saved through the revival of classical Materia Medica. The garden thus connected students, in this case, to the world of pharmacy in Venice. <clears throat> in Padua, um, professors, including the famous anatomist Andreas Vesalius, um, which Hannah showed us uh, the volume of his Fabrica, um, these professors offered examples to students of the kind of learning that could emerge with the freedom to ask questions and openly dispute the findings or the account of their colleagues. Vesalius, like many of his colleagues, participated in medical humanism. So he was reviving the work of Galen, but as he pointed out over and over again, he was correcting the errors of the past in order uh, to augment the role and function of medicine eventually in practice. Um, so there was a kind of a, a sense of um, freedom in. Um, the work that he uh, uh, produced. By the mid 16th century, students too began to assert their commitment to the study of anatomy. Uh, there's a letter uh, from Gabriele Fallopio uh, from 1556, in which he says that he's requesting support for the annual anatomy demonstration, the annual dissection. But in the letter, he made sure to highlight the eagerness of the students, especially the German and Polish students, or what's, what they're usually referred to as the transalpine students uh, for a public anatomy demonstration. The students' ability or opportunity to assert themselves or exhibit a kind of willfulness, however, was constrained in the public arenas of anatomical study. So permanent uh, anatomical theaters housed anatomy demonstrations in January and February. These were the coldest months of the year and a good time to dissect bodies uh, without um, things like formaldehyde to preserve them. According to the university statutes, the bodies used in the demonstration would be the bodies of foreign and criminal um, people, people who had been executed for their crimes. Depending on a variety of factors, anatomists could use the annual demonstration, right, the, the, the lesson, the lecture, to introduce students to human anatomy in a comprehensive way. They could also use it um, uh, to focus on specific sites or structures or functions. Um, and then they might also use it to focus on questions of normative and pathological anatomies. Um, in practice, these pedagogical missions on the part of the professor were inevitably adapted. There could be practical considerations such as the parts of the cadaver that were putrefying or liquefying. Uh, there could also be social or cultural considerations. For example, even before the permanent anatomy theater of 1594-95, the main anatomist, Girolamo Fabrici in 1589 gave a uh, an anatomy demonstration that began with the dissection of the muscles related to speech. So the larynx and the voice box and so forth. In the middle of the demonstration, he paused to connect the subject matter to his audience, um, to the students. A transalpine student recorded this description in the official records of, um, of the transalpine nation of students. 
uh, Fabrici began on this occasion of his sermon to ridicule the pronunciation of Latin of various student nations. In the midst, he arrived at our praiseworthy nation saying, the pronunciation of the Transalpines is hard and slow, since indeed they wish to pronounce words while they compress the mouth excessively. This would be the cause, so that always they pronounce awkwardly the foof for the vu. And for the record, he began to demonstrate the words. Imitating the speech of the Transalpines, um, Fabrici meant uh, he who drinks wine lives a long time. The students found his joke, however, that they slurred their speech and spoke, as they said, like drunkards. They found it humiliating. By their account, Fabrici put forth these words uh, endlessly, and he felt a great joy from these words, so much repeated that he was unable to contain his own laughter. Although Fabrici completed his joke, the Transalpine students felt exposed in the presence of all the other nations. With this joke, this professor had called attention to the Transalpine students as foreigners, flagging their status as linguistic and demographic outsiders. So this wasn't a grammar lesson at all, but the scene captures the less obvious and more coercive functions of the anatomical theater. Its ability to configure and recognize the social relations of students and their professors, and its ability to connect academic themes quite literally uh, to issues of both classical education, Latinity, and civility, the manner of speaking. It is difficult to imagine that transalpine students felt especially empowered to exercise their freedom after their humiliating encounter with Fabrici and their peers in the anatomical theater. So medical humanism was tied, deeply tied to texts, to translations, editorial emendations, critical commentaries, and so forth, but it also depended on vocal exchange. So oral, not written culture was shaped by humanism as Fabrici's attack on the speech of, of transalpine students indicates. What's more is that this episode highlights or indeed activates a crucial set of oppositions. We have then Italian versus transalpine students. We have Southern versus Northern Latinity, how they spoke Latin. We have civility versus incivility. Right? So civility versus kind of drunkenness. Um, we have speech versus silence. And then finally, may, maybe we have reason versus its drunken counterpart. In light of these oppositions, the assertiveness of the Italian, uh, excuse me, of the transalpine students was being framed by Italians, by their Southern speech patterns and by their forms of civility. These in turn place clear limits on the seemingly universal construction of reason. And also I think on how uh, we think about libertas. Um, so how should we define academic freedom in this era? So that's a big question, but students uh, at the university in Padua in the early modern period responded differently. Not only did they watch their professors who modeled a life seemingly devoted to libertas, developing linguistic rigor, scrutinizing text, interrogating doctrine, asserting their own views. But they also came together collectively to express their desires for certain kinds of instruction. It was students who requested um, the, the uh, botanical garden. It was students who requested more instruction on anatomy that eventually culminated in the anatomical theater. Libertas, however, was also qualified by the sociocultural conditions of the University of Padua as a site of diversity. Geographical, economic, religious, and cultural differences abounded in this setting, with the result often that transalpine students were more routinely and more fully regulated than cisalpine students. These regulatory forces were not separate from scientific pursuits, moreover. While all students were conditioned to respect authority, the subject of additional regulations and oversight, inside the anatomical theater, they might be acknowledged for their earnest pursuits in anatomy or 
ridiculed during a lecture on the organs of speech. In the latter case, it seems that libertas was not evenly distributed across the student body, even within the theater itself. Instead, in Padua, the indigenous culture and its forms prevailed, suggesting an origin or maybe a condition for postgraduate expressions of freedom, such as the ones Gandaldino offered the Inquisition when he insisted on his right to seek unsettling truths. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy, especially for your kindness uh, to be here at a time zone that is not uh, so, many, so much favorable for you. <laughs> I think it's uh, night uh, in Ohio. And, and uh, so thank you very much for your presentation and for your kindness. Uh, now uh, we, we move fast uh, to the next uh, presentation by Giulia Albanese on the, about the Center for Human Rights. Giulia Albanese is uh, Associate Professor of Modern History here at the University of Padua, where she also coordinates uh, the PhD in Historical and Geographical and Anthropological Studies at the University of Padua and Foscari. Uh, she is an expert on, of fascism, political violence, and authoritarian culture in the interwar years, with a particular focus on the circulation and the impact of fascism in Europe, and more recently uh, with the citizenship in the same context. She, uh, she is the author of uh, many books and articles on these topics. Uh, I would like to mention the translation of the book on La Marcia su Roma, published by La Terza in 2006, uh, recently published in English uh, by, uh, by Routledge, uh, Routledge Publisher in 2019, The March on Rome, Violence and the Rise of Italian Fascism. Um, and uh, with Roberta Perger, she edited uh, In the Society of Fascists, uh, Acclamation, Acquiescence, and Agency in Mussolini's Italy with Palgrave in 2012. Um, she will uh, uh, present us uh, uh, one of the topics of uh, our book, and especially the Center for Human Rights. Thank you very much, Giulia. Thank you, Andrea. I'm very happy to be here at such an important uh, uh, conference on freedom. Uh, as you've heard, I'm not an expert of human rights nor of uh, uh, the Second World War, uh, the, the, the Republican period. Uh, and uh, uh, while uh, Paola was uh, talking, I was wondering that maybe I should have worked on the way in which uh, Carlo Anti considered uh, freedom, that is a very important topic because uh, it always struck me as uh, the member of the fascist party, uh, a, a rector who had uh, developed uh, Russian laws in this university, etc., could be the reinventor of, re <laughs> of the Patavinas uh, Libertas. And, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, be that as it may, I decided that it was important also to uh, uh, work in an historical way on uh, the uh, building of the Center of Human Rights, uh, which was the first center of this kind in any university in Italy. Uh, and so uh, in the struggle between uh, uh, if history is meant to uh, work on uh, let's say, bad period in order to uh, learn how to uh, deal with them, or if it is, uh, uh, um, if, it is uh, um, it, if it is its duty to enlighten a good example in order to uh, establish good practices, for once I decided to work on the center of human rights as, uh, as uh, something to reflect upon. So the Article 1 of Title 1 of the Statute of the University of Padua approved in 1995 reads, the University of Padua, in accordance with the principles of the Constitution of the Italian Republic and its tradition that dates back to 1222, and is summarized in the motto Universas Universis Patavina Libertas affirms its pluralistic character and its independence from all ideological, religious, political, and eco or economic conditioning and discrimination. It promotes the development of a culture based on values universals as human rights, peace, environmental protection, and solidarity. 
The, the article, which is still in force today, was the result of a movement originated by the Center for Human Rights for these values to be explicitly recognized, anchoring them in a tradition which is, of course, less continuous and linked with nowadays values than public discourse hints. This was undoubtedly a victory for the Center for Human Rights and for its founder, Antonio Papisca, because it recognized an overlap between the objectives that had led to the foundation of this institution and the more general aims of the University of Padua and signaled the importance assumed by the Center, an institution that had been established in Padua in 1982 and that constituted at the time of its establishment an absolute novelty in the Italian landscape. The aim of this paper is to reconstruct the origins of an original and innovative institution in the context not only of the university's history, but also in the wider uh, cultural context. The 70s constituted a moment of a broader recognition of the role of the, that human rights played as an identifying element in the process of the European constitution uh, uh, construction, albeit with all the contradiction of the case. The development of policies, uh, of policies aimed at the recognition of human rights was part of an attempt by the European community to unhinge the logic of the Cold War, but also part of the desire to highlight the limits in, of the political framework of the Soviet bloc in a direction that undoubtedly contributed to the strengthening of internal opposition forces in the Warsaw Pact and in the, in the, of the breakup of the bloc itself. This process was ma also made possible by the decolonization process uh, of the previous decades, which had in fact contributed to the rising of human rights awareness and standards in Europe. It was a, a process in which some new actors emerged strongly. Firstly, during the Conference on Security and Cooperation, which culminated in the Helsinki, Helsinki Final Act, in particular non-governmental organization, but also groups of experts, journalists and activists whose role in the de development of human rights policies, uh, policies was crucial. Secondly, the accession, the accession, the accession sorry, to the papal throne of Carol uh, uh, Joseph Wojtyla and his push for human rights policy defined a new framework of attention in the Catholic world for this issue. It is in this context that the elaboration of, this, of the prospect uh, for the establishment of a center for, uh, for studies and training on human and people's rights at the University of Padova should be placed, starting from dynamics that were also very local. The proposal for the, uh, for the developing, uh, uh, the proposal developed in fact in a faculty that had suffered and was divided over the role and political impact of the Autonomia Operaia and, uh, and, the seventh, uh, and the 7th of April trial. The center was certainly envisaged also as a chance to offer a new image to the Faculty of Political Science by the person who, just after the trial uh, uh, against the Autonomia Operaia began, had been called to preside over it in 1980. The first public announcement of the desire to build a center for human rights emerged does in a moment of internal confrontation within the faculty on the role and space that international political debate should have in university activities. The Sabra and Shatila massacre in Lebanon and the Dean's decision to propose a motion in the Faculty of Political Science Council on the subject opened a debate not only on the merits, but also on the appropriateness of the faculty's public intervention on these issues and, this, and on this rather than on other cases, fearing not only that these interventions was biased, even with respect to the political positioning of the different parties in the international scenario still marked by the Cold War, but also that this intervention could legitimize the development of anti-Semitic discourses. The motion, which in fact split the faculty with 24 votes in favor and 20 uh, abstention and three against, was approved uh, and during the discussion, Antonio Papisca proposed the idea of quickly setting up a center on fundamental rights and freedom to make permanent and not specifically oriented the faculty discussion on human rights violations. 
The initiative could be considered in line with other initiatives proposed that same year by Papiska and thus probably the fruit of a, of a search for a perspective capable of integrating scientific interests and the militant afflatus that certainly coexist in uh, Antonio Papisca. And it was precisely in this direction that in March 1982, Antonio Papisca proposed conferring an honorary degree of, uh, on, uh, for Antonio Spinelli on account of his pro-European commitment, I quote, to preserve the peoples of Europe from the endemic scourge of the war. Undoubtedly, Antonio Papisca's biography and his elaboration went in the direction of valorizing the role of human rights as an element of democratization and the construction of a peaceful international equilibrium, also within the magisterium of John Paul II. However, the importance that pacifist mobilization in Italy was experiencing in those same years, and the profound turning point that was uh, beginning to be glimpsed in this sphere, also counted in his elaboration and in his, in his decision to launch a specific commitment to human rights. The 60s and 70s had in fact constituted an important moment of institutionalization of the pacifist movement through the creation of the Council for Peace in the aftermath of the first uh, Perugia Sisi Peace March, uh, March in 1961 and the development of, a, of, of an objection of conscience movement that in 72 led to the promulgation of a law recognizing the right to object to uh, the military service. The birth of the center, however, occurred in the aftermath of the installation of an OTAN uh, missile base in Comiso, Sicily, and of the protest movement of a, an environmentalist and pacifist group against this decision, a protest that united Catholic and secular pacifist associations and the communist, radical, and extra-parliamentary left. The center thus began with the constant tension as well as a significant integration between its capacity for scientific elaboration and university tr training and its intervention in society. It may thus be noted that in the early years of the center's activities and life, the life of the community, not only the academic community, was divided between Padua and the university and the city of Vicenza, where several of the center's specific and public initiatives took place. Starting with the first conference on human rights, for ma formation and promotion held in March 1983. The conference had a process that was not only scientific, but it, as it held together a program of intervention on society, pointing to the inclusion of the team and method of human rights at an institutional, educational, and scientific level, as well as aiming at a scientific re reflection on these issues. Significant and favored by Papiska's past as an activist in the international Catholic movement was also the presence of personalities from the world of international and non-governmental institutions, including the president of Amnesty International, representative of the European Parliament, and the UN High Commission for Refugees, UNESCO, and the UN Human Rights Center, among others. The center would build a permanent relationship with this institution, which was reflected in the Center Scientific Committee from the outset, and which was renewed through the participation in conference and the sharing of activities with these personalities with the aim of bringing together local authorities and international institutions, non-governmental institutions, and, and the scientific world. For Papiska, however, it was important that the radiating place for this activity was the university. While the entry into force of the international treaties on civil and political rights and the one on economic and social rights in 1976 obliged the signatory state to radically transform their perspective on the evaluation of institutions, since they constituted, I quote, the approach through which they have to ascertain the quality of social, political, and economic system, the Council of Europe um, resolutions of, of autumn uh, 78 and 1979 invited university authorities and other rele relevant authorities to encourage the study of international and national protection of human rights in compulsory or optional teaching programs in the various disciplines at the university level. 
In short, this was a way of highlighting, starting from the international and community law under construction, the need for the action that was taking place at the University of Padua in a context that at the national level did not seem particularly receptive. This context of international declaration in Papiscan interpretation could not fail to have a profound scientific as well as a civil implication and committed to a view that held both on international perspective, because states were less than ever bearers of law encumbered by international juris jurisprudence, and an uh, in, in, in interdisciplinary one. It could be said, however, that with respect to the funder's ambition, which was, as explicitly said in the center presentation dossier, to shape the entire body of scientific knowledge as well as Italian and international institution at all level, the center activities had, been, had to be limited to a few specific activities in the early years, including the launch of training courses and postgraduate specialization courses, as well as the creation of a specific curricula in the Doctorate of International Relations dedicated to human rights. Over the years, Papiska's work would also bear some fruit in the academic disciplinary field, leading in the mid-90s to the creation of, the uni of university chairs of the International Protection of Human Rights in the international law sector, and the first to teach this uh, discipline would be Antonio Papiska himself, and of human rights in the philosophy of law sector, and to human rights uh, becoming one of the disciplines taught in Italian universities. At the same time, the objective of establishing a disciplinary field would be strengthened with the foundation of a journal, Peace, Human Rights and the Rights of People, and a series of uh, studies and research on human rights. The extraction of a program that was being defined in the university, which aimed to hold together the more strictly national dimension through monitoring how Italy fulfills its international human rights obligation and through training with an international uh, core, especially with refer reference to the role of non-governmental organization. A huge amount of activities in any case, which show the center ability to involve in its program of action a non insignificant number of colleagues from its faculty, from different cultural, scientific, and even religi religious perspective, but all in the uh, uh, and, uh, that in the same way aggregated around values and perspective of human rights, uh, but also to bring to Padua students and professionals interested in studying the subject in depth. This ensured that there was a constant involvement of students in the political and cultural activity carried out by the funder and the management of the uh, team in the direction of social responsibility and the militant approach to the discipline. A declaration of Libertas Patavina that, as we have seen, was not always shared within the university, but, made very, uh, but was made very explicit within the center. Remarkable of this originalist perspective, however, was the fact that Padua remained, even a decade, a decade after the center was funded, the only Italian academic institution to have dedicated a specific space for reflection, action, and scientific didactic intervention to human rights. And it had its moment of reinforcement on the 40th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1988, when Padua was asked to uh, have uh, the uh, first uh, uh, Italian meeting uh, uh, celebrating this uh, uh, declaration. It is not possible here to discuss in detail how the positioning of the center and its role would change in the somewhat complicated context that would open up in, after 1989. Papista reflected a few years later that the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, uh, that the fall of the Berlin Wall removed the alibi of bipolarism behind which states had hitherto entrenched themselves in order not to put the UN in a position to operate promptly and effectively. From the end of the 80s onward, alongside the action deployed in the educational sphere, the center intervention in civil society and uh, of political nature in defense of human rights became more extensive. This also happened because in this moment, the prospects for peace and the, the definitive and indisputable affirmation of human rights had not broadened. 
on the contrary, the, the early 90s saw Italy's participation in the go first Gulf War and subsequently the opening of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. And these events painfully affected the thinking of those who worked in the center and more generally their activity and public presence. In this context, there was a new value of a presence on the ground that had been that of the origins, but with a great push uh, by those who animated the center, Antonio Papisca and Mar uh, Marco Mascia, uh, first and foremost, to discuss, to discuss war and peace, the role assigned by, the, uh, by this issue by the Italian constitution, the role of the UN, the right to self-determination of people at as and association, uh, in association, schools, local authorities, and that, uh, uh, and that uh, moved the articulated Cato uh, Catholic world from a perspective that was not only political or civil, but also scientific. All, all of this constituted an absolutely new activity to compare, compared to the first years of activity of the center, and it seems to me that it can speak of a complicated balance to be struck between academic freedom, political and civil action, and presence in the territory, which is worth reflecting in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Julia for this uh, important uh, overview of the long process and also complex process in the formation and institutionalization of a center that is central for the discussion that we are uh, having in these days. Uh, so before to move to the second part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, book lunch, uh, uh, we will have a five minutes break. Uh, there is a, co a coffee at the end of the room, so maybe Five minutes, no more. Please uh, come back. <laughs>
Test, test, 1, 2, 3. Sì, sì. Non diciamo niente di male. No, no, no. <laughs> Qualche brutta parola. So I think that we can back to our session. If, um, if you would like to, to take your seat. Okay. Uh, now uh, we take also the opportunity to present uh, to different, uh, to other books of the series, uh, of the book series uh, on Patavina Libertas, uh, with two contributions from two authors. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two of them are not uh, able uh, to, to join uh, this uh, presentation. But the first one is on uh, internationalization and foreign students, uh, the book on stranieri, foreigners, uh, that uh, is uh, currently on press. It will be published uh, maybe at the end of the summer. And uh, that was co-edited by Giulia Zornetta and Maria Cristina La Rocca, who unfortunately are not able to be here. But uh, Paola Molina will present uh, a, a short introduction uh, on several topic, uh, topics that this book uh, um, analyzes. Uh, so, Paola, it's your, the floor is yours. So, um, so I, I'm reading actually a presentation that the two authors and editors of the volumes have given to me. I'm also one of the authors in the volume, so at least uh, <laughs> I have contributed to it with an article. Uh, but uh, as said, I am trying to. Uh, to, to read because um, this is what they have prepared. This presentation is both on the book in the first part and in the second part it is about a database. It's about a project in digital humanities that has been carried out by one of the curator of this volume, Giulia Zernetta, by Danny Solera who is also the curator of our volume on the Libertas and also Andrea, um, um, no, you, yeah, you too, yeah, and also Andrea Martini. So at the very, at the latest part of this presentation, I will also say something about this database. So um, the core interest in this, of this volume on uh, foreigners is in mapping and reconstructing student mobility in the past centuries to the University of, of Padua. This interest arose at the time when, to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the university, Giulia and Maria Cristina realized that very often the history of universities is observed only through the lens and the experience of the most famous scientists. We have also mentioned before Galileo, and we have mentioned, and um, we always mention the same kind of heroes in the history of a university. Uh, who are, for this very reason, presented as icons of an excellent and special image of their university. Instead, what they aim to do through their project is to observe the university as a meeting point between many men, young and old men, and of different geographical origins, who, through their presence, shape the spirit, the character, and lifestyle of the university in relation to the city of Padua in which the university is located. So the idea is, was of this volume was that of concentrating on the actual actors that have uh, animated the life of the university. They speak about men mainly because for a long time the university was an exclusively male space. Padova, as I said, has been the place in which a woman graduated in the 17th century, Elena Cornaro Piscopia, but this was an exception, which also didn't have consequences immediately after. Then Andrea will speak about this topic more afterwards. So the protagonists of all three volumes are actually the students 
that have graduated at the University of Padua from its origin until the 20th century. But uh, in particular, the volume on foreigners, this has been the minutes of the degree in philosophy of Elena Cornaro Piscopia in 1678. Sorry, I was able supposed to present it earlier. And these are the two volumes. This is uh, uh, our, and this is the one that Andrea is going to present afterwards on women. This one on foreigners, as Andrea said, is still on the press. So, um, the number of students varied in time and geographical spaces, and, uh, uh, and uh, Studying the students shows that uh, um, the student community has always been enriched by a large component coming from outside the city of Padua. Here you can see the Italic students in the 13th and 15th century, but also, sorry, yeah. but also from Germany, France, Poland, Greece, and also from the southern of Italy. Through a veritable chain of migration, students arrived in Padua through established routes. And here you can see the Francophone route. They were pushed by friends, teachers, and families. And here you can see the Eastern Alpine route. In every period of the academic year, Padua was thus transformed into a city intensely inhabited by foreigners, young men for the most part lacking affective and family ties, locally and eager to build their careers and professional future, arrive in Padua, and here they found not only their fellow countrymen, but also many foreigners who came from cities and cultural background different from their own, and together with them they studied, attending lectures of famous teachers participated in the graduation parties of their friends, and in the highlights of city life, include, and also they participated in the highlights of city life, including also tension and confrontations. Here you can see a map of the student residences in Padua in the 16th century, and the map of student colleges. Here, uh, yeah, this is afterwards. So, then, after finishing their studies, they would return to their place of origin, enriched by new experiences and new acqu acquisitions, and by a curriculum visit that proved not only that they studied and got in touch with the most famous professors personally, but also that on their Peregrinatio Academica, this is the name that means the, the, the academic travel that undertook in the pre-modern time, they had met many other influential personalities with whom they had forged last, lasting friendship. Some of this friendship would last forever, even if the live meeting would never be repeated, as their letters and book exchanges testifies. And here you can see, for instance, the map of the provenance of the students that presumably have listened to the lectures of Galileo Galilei. This is these are the students that were enrolled in the Faculty of Mathematics uh, at the time of Galileo Galilei. Once they returned to their country with such a human and cultural baggage, gained and developed in Padua, they started their own careers. Sometimes they hold important public offices, and their success could have been a stimulus for new students, who in turn undertook the journey to Padua. The experience gained in the course of their studies was in fact not only professional, but also an experience of urban life and training in politics. The organization of the university in nations implied that each student belonged to the group of his countrymen who participated in the election of the rector. In Padua, foreign students took an active part in running internal organization of their universities and learn the art of mediating and representing their own community, confronting themselves with members of the other nations. The intertwining of experiences and knowledge, as well as the attendance of large and varied groups, allowed these men to return home 
very different from how they left and to keep the memory of the years they lived in Padua as a fundamental stage of their life. Here you see, for instance, there are some graves of injuries, so of injuries and conflicts among uh, uh, stu students. This is one of the 18th century. This that you can see here is a Liber Amicorum. They were the books that students carried with them when they came to Padua and in which uh, people could write a dedication or simply a sentence. They were meant to remember, but also cr to create the actual network. Claudia would say before, this is the key word in the last years. So by reading this album Amicorum, you can recreate the network of the people that were there when a certain student was in Padua. Here you can see a, dedica a, a dedication of, uh, or, a, of Galileo Galilei in the um, Liber Amicorum of the Scottish poet Thomas Seget. Okay. And this is a plan of uh, the Nova Polonia Civitas, so uh, the Padua of the North, it was a project that was uh, conceived by a student uh, from Padua, an important and uh, uh, famous one, Jan Samoski, great headman of the crown, that was in Padua um, in the middle of the 16th century. Some of these students um, remained in Padua for the rest of their lives. Here, they married or they were buried they acquired a new identity as university professors, as it is attested in the inscriptions of their graves at the Basilica del Santo and in the churches of the Eremitani and Santa Sofia. Here you can see the matriculation of the nations that I have said before. This is the Ciclo Artista, so the name of uh, some of the students that you can find in the bow, you will see them this afternoon. And this is the church of uh, uh, Santa La Basilica del Santo here in Padua, in which you can see the grave of different students and professors from the University of Padua. So the internal organization of the volume Stranieri intend to capture this mobility of students and professors in Padua from the beginning of the 13th century until around the 18th century. After contextualizing the phenomenon of the emergence of university in a broad European panorama, the flows to Padua to different, from different groups, from France, Poland, Germany, Southern Italy, are examined. Today, when we will go to the guided tour, they will explain again how this, simple com this different community of scholars were organizing nations. The central part of the volume is instead dedicated to examining the involvement of foreign students in the city. There is a part devoted, for instance, to accommodation. There is a part devoted to the participation in city events. And finally, the students' relationship and the, all the problems that are related to public order, as I was, was showing uh, before. Finally, there is a last part of the book in which there is also the chapter that I have written, that is an attempt to grasp what kind of careers were open to graduates after having attended the University of Padua, once they return in their own countries, and also what kind of memories students brought with them after they, their experience in Padua, and to what an extent this network that was created had an impact on their future career. That is another way to say how the student mobility has affected the cultural, political, and social life of Europe from the Middle Age until <coughs> the modern age. Now, the stages of mobility, sorry, are material, but are also mental. Leaving, staying, returning, and remembering. For each of them in the book, we have tried to map not only the itineraries of migration and return, but also to bring to life the student stay in Padua and to show which moments and occasions transform their identity. They arrived as foreigners and then they were incorporated into the student body, but also into the life of the city 
thus becoming a special part of the inhabitants of Padua, very similar as it is actually today. Now, in order to understand which different stages and which flows of students were directed toward Padua over a long period of time, we asked ourselves a number of questions. First of all, how were students' migration to Padua structures, also structured, sorry, also in quantitative terms? Were there differences over time between students from the Germanic Empire and those from the French-speaking or Polish area? And once they arrived in Padua, how was their staying in the city organized? Did they all live in a specific area or with their fellow countrymen in different areas? Apart from attending classes, what kind of life, entertainment, activities did the student engage in? What was their relationship with the city authorities? And finally, what testimonies, what material memories did they leave us? These were the questions that persuaded us to build a database that would collect not only the personal details of each student, their name and place of origin, but also the diploma they obtain and, when it is attested in our sources, their place of residence in Padua. And this is the main face of the database. The tool that we used to build this list, which was a so far, which so far amounts about 50,000 people, is the BO 2022 prosopographical database, which in the future could be linked to other academic databases of similar structure, such as um, the one you can see here. On this basis, the data from the University of Padua will be merged with those of other ancient universities in Europe through the LUAS network, the one that you see in here, that uh, included prosopographic data of Bologna, the Sorbonne in Paris, and many universities in the German area, providing an impressive amount of information that will allow us to fully understand the impact of academic mobility in cultural and scientific life, in the construction of new questions, hypotheses, common or discordant solutions, but also of scientific solidarities or just friendship or competition. As the database fill up with data and attendance, we quickly realized that the collection allowed us to answer even more questions. Indeed, the students' experiences and contacts with their professors and other foreign students allowed us to investigate in a deeper perspective how the Patavina Libertas declined during the years of the Counter-Reformation, allowing us to understand how, in such a critical period, it was structured in a complex intertwining of religious freedom and the independence of philosophy and theology. The database allowed us also to observe the concrete rhythm of the spread of forbidden men and text, as also Anna has shown before, their origins and trajectories. And as Andrea will show afterwards, the database also allowed to map the quantity the, uh, the, sorry, to map and quantify, quantify the progressive presence of women at the University of Padua after the illustrious ex exception of Elena Cornaro Piscopia. It would take a long time in Padua, as in all of Europe, for women to be granted the right to enjoy a university education and to participate in the academic community. And it is significant that among, um, sorry, And it is significant, sorry, that among the pioneers in the last three decades of the 19th century were several foreigners, for example, from Russia and Eastern Europe, who came to Padua to pursue studies not yet possible in their home countries. The database also clearly shows us the progression of the feminization of the university and its acceleration in the second half of the 20th century up to the current situation when female graduates outnumber their male colleagues.
אוקיי. שבעה. In short, the BO 2022 database represents an indispensable tool to understand in a deeper way what the role of university has been since its beginning as a meeting point and relationship between men and women who converged, even for short periods, in a university and a city other than the one in which they were born and grew up. That is, to understand the role of mobility between the university in building the progress of scientific knowledge and dialogue between foreigners. The mobility of male and female students is not only an aspect involving the university of the past, but is also a strong instance of the present and the future. For this reason, our research has been coordinated with a global development perspective, which shows the commitment and the complexities of scenarios that student mobility entails in the present testifying to the awareness on the part of our academic authorities of the relevance and fundamental role of foreign students in promoting the growth of knowledge and civil coexistence. Last but not least, the two curators would like to warmly thank all the more than 15 students, trainees of the History and Historical Sciences degree courses who led by the three research fellows, Giulia Zornetta, Danny Solera, and Andrea Martini, who is sitting next to me, have passionately endeavored to enter into the database the data on graduate students in Padua over time. Their work has allowed us to reach the figure of 50,000 in a relatively short time. It is to them, to these students, and those who will follow them, that the database both 2022 is dedicated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, for this presentation. And now we move to um, Andrea Martini, who, will, uh, who is also an author of the book Libertas, uh, with a, a chapter on the transition between fascism and uh, democracy. But uh, today he will present also uh, the uh, book that he co-authored with uh, Carlotta Sorba on the University of the Women. Uh, Andrea Martini received a PhD in International Studies at the University of Naples Orientale in 2017 and is currently a research fellow at the Gerda Enkel Stiftung. Formerly, he was a research fellow at the University of Padua, where he uh, coordinated this project and he participated also to the uh, construction of the database uh, BO 2022. He is the author also of the book After Mussolini, uh, published by Viella, and co editor of the book uh, L'Università delle Donne. Now he will speak about women and academic freedom. Yes, thank you, Andrea, for the presentation, and thank you, the thanks. I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity because it gave us the, the chance, basically, to, uh, to think, or let's say, to rethink our volume about women and the female presence uh, over the course of the history of the University of Padua from uh, a different perspective basically from a, a perspective of academic freedom. I said we because, uh, uh, of course, I co-edited this uh, book with uh, Professor Carlotta Sorba, who can't be here today because she's attending another conference in Amsterdam uh, in the morning. Uh, but yes, as, as um, I was trying to say, I think that this connection between uh, academic freedom and gender equality is very strong. In fact, uh, uh, can one speak basically of academic freedom and freedom of expression in the universities if uh, universities preclude or obstacle the access of uh, women in their double role as students and as researchers? And the answer is very predictable, of course, is no. So in line with the rest uh, of um, the Patavina Liberta series of books, uh, the one edited by myself and Carlotta Sorba is not a volume conceived to paint a rosy picture of the history of the University of Padua, of course. On the contrary, the intention was to, let's say, to force the university 
um, to come to terms with controversial passages and turning points of its history and of its present as well. It's indeed true, and it was something that it was a remark uh, even today, that Padua hosted the first, probably the first, female uh, students who graduated in philosophy in 1678, Elena Cornaro Piscopia, but it was quite an exceptional case, as we said before. Uh, the women path to first gain free access to the uni university, then to attend it as much as men, and finally to be able to enter it as teaching staff was extremely long and controversial. Women, in fact, had to deal with strong resistance, and this path, uh, we can say, is not, be, it's not concluded, I think. So, uh, today I would like just to give you a global overview of our volume, and uh, um, focusing on uh, adopting um, a long-term perspective in particular. So I would like just to talk about not only the contemporary age, but also the modern period. Um, but uh, at the same time, I would like in the last part of my paper uh, to focus on the more contemporary issues, in particular how, in, in general, the issue of the presence of women in university is still top is still topical, despite in different terms, of course, than in the past. But let me, uh, first of all, give you some methodological remarks, because when we started conceiving these books, um, Carlotta Sarba and I, we had uh, a kind of problem, because uh, uh, in particular in the Italian historiography, there are several books about a specific history of university, let's say the history of the University of Pavia, the history of the University of Bologna, and so on. But these, uh, um, these volumes uh, didn't adopt a gendered approach. So it, it was a big issue for, for us uh, to deal with. And um, in the end, we decided that it wasn't uh, uh, enough to um, adopt a kind of addition, let's say, history of universities plus history, gender history. We needed to integrate uh, the gender category in the history of universities in order to question, as you can see in this slide, how gender asymmetries have continually reshaped educational itineraries and how women have faced and sometimes overcome obstacles and difficulties. And then we decided to um, adopt uh, a double approach, I mean, um, to intertwine a, a kind of macro history in order to observe uh, a, a long trend uh, and institutional dynamics, for instance. So to intertwine macro history with a specific individual trajectories of life. So we decided to focus on specific uh, um, case studies that, of course, for reason of time today, I, uh, I uh, cannot... Um, um, I cannot analyze deeply, um, but this is the, the, uh, the methodological approach that characterizes our volume. And as I told you before, we decided to adopt in general long-term perspective, because it's of course true that the female presence in the history of the University of Padua and in general in the history of the universities uh, was uh, significant only starting from the 19th and uh, 20th century, of course. But it's also important to know and mm, uh, uh, to adopt a long-term perspective, also to better understand what happened before, and in particular in uh, some centuries, like the 17th and the 18th century, that hosted uh, a, a very significant debate that in French is called querelle des femmes. Um, and this querelle, this debate, um, um, concern the potential, the natural skills of women, how women could improve the knowledge, 
or not. There was a, a very intensive debate about it. And in this debate, men and women participate and wrote a lot. Even here in Padua and the Veneto region in general played a crucial role in this querelle des femmes. I just show you uh, a pictures of a book cover uh, written here in Padua in 1729 uh, by um, several authors who discuss about the women skills and the possibility for women to um, foster the knowledge with their skills, with their natural skills. So there was something about the presence of women also before the, the contemporary age, but then it's, it can sound strange. Of course, during at least the first half of the 19th century, we can, uh, uh, um, we can observe, let's say, a kind of a sudden stop of course, the 19th century was the age of revolution, like the French Revolution, for instance. But in general, as Carlotta Sorba wrote in her chapter, women, in particular during the first half of the 19th century, were confined to the domestic sphere and to became good wives and mothers. Universities and academic knowledge in general wasn't certainly necessary. Then we had a, a kind of a, a, a reversal uh, in the second half of the 19th century when women uh, finally starting uh, uh, studying at University of Padua as well in other universities in Italy, but also in other uh, European um, countries, but also in the United States. Um, sometimes uh, we can find out uh, specific laws that gave women the opportunity to uh, get access to the universities. Sometimes there was uh, also a very significant debate about the presence of women. In other cases, like in Italy, there were just uh, some laws, or to be more precise, to more accurate, some decree uh, who tended to regulate the, the university system. Uh, the two decrees uh, um, are the one put in place in 1875 and the other one in 1876. But uh, around this decree, we didn't find a very significant debate. There were just two uh, decrees aimed at regulating the university system and among a lot of points uh, analyzed by these uh, decrees, there was uh, one point who gave basically women the opportunity to get access at university. So at least for the Italian case, uh, we don't recognize uh, a, a strong and intensive debate. It was just something, uh, a natural process, a very long process as well. But, uh, so we can say that uh, the, the female presence started increasing <coughs> in the last decades of the 19th century and during the first decades of the 20th century. But, uh, of course, uh, we, had, uh, we have to wait for so many decades until uh, we can find the first female professor in the history of the University of Padua. And it was uh, Massimilla, uh, also known as Milla Baldo Ciolin, who was uh, um, a physicist, a particle physicist, who uh, became uh, the first uh, uh, female professor in 1963. Uh, is the one in the biggest pictures, whereas uh, the second one is uh, the botanist Albina Messeri, the one in the smallest picture. So I, I was uh, I tried to um, to explain to you how long uh, it takes to have a significant number of female students in the uh, University of Padua and in the Italian universities. Uh, the fascist age is a period of contradictions, of a lot of contradiction, basically. Also because in 1926, uh, the dictatorship prevented women to become teacher of Italian, Latin, Greek, and so on in the secondary school. So, of course, this couldn't help women to be part of the university system. So the, the other very important watershed and turning point uh, for what concerned the female presence is the, 19, is the 1960s and the 1970s. 
It's the time of women and it's the time for women. Uh, that is the period where we can find out a significant increase of female students in every university. Of course, it was also the period where the universities stopped being a, an elite institution and started being a mass institution. And these decades uh, marked the, a new era, as I said before, uh, for these women, new worlds and new horizons, we can say. I also collected some, uh, um, some testimonies about that from women who graduated in the 60s and the 70s. One of them, Gloria Piardi, said to me that going to university means, I quote, going out into the world, whereas for another one, Barbara Piacenza, who uh, came from Sardinia, uh, enrolling in the Faculty of Medicine, I quote, was a very drastic choice, uh, but one that allowed her to make an incredible leap, accessing a totally new environment. But of course, it's also important to look at that in decades with uh, and that turning point with a critical high, with a critical perspective because the path to a gender equality for what concerns the female students' presence was still a long one. And uh, only in the academic year 1990, 1991, in Italy and in Padua as well, the number of female students overtook men in terms, in terms of uh, inscriptions, in, in terms of the number of enrolled students, I can say. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I would like to conclude with this uh, consideration about the contemporary issues, as pointed out by the chapter written by Naila Pratelli and Lorenza Perini, um, in the entire Western society, including Italy, uh, strong gender stereotypes, for instance, still operate in the minds of boys and girls, and these stereotypes condition their subsequent study choices, so we cannot fix the problem completely of gender equality, the problem persists. And even if we uh, take into account uh, some data about uh, specific universities, we can find that the path for the gender equality is still long. I don't want to give you a lot of data about that, but I will just shed some light on some overall trends. Still today, for, uh, for, for example, sorry, Female students have a low tendency to choose among the so-called STEM courses, so science, technology, engineering, and math um, fields, area of studies uh, offered by the Padua University as other universities, even if the trend is changing in the recent years, of course. Despite a higher percentage of female graduates and a higher average grade than men, men tend to find jobs earlier than women. While women outnumber men among PhD students, women find it more difficult to advance their careers in the universities, to gain a position as a researcher, let alone as a professor. I don't know whether we can still talk about the so-called glass ceiling effect that would prevent women from accessing high-ranking position, but I think that for sure this glass selling as several cracks. But as we emphasize in the last part of our volume, it's also maybe important to refocus our debate uh, on, another, um, on another area, let's say. I mean, uh, the importance to uh, open each field of knowledge developed by the universities to a general approach because only a gender perspective can enrich, can improve our knowledge, basically, in different, in a great variety of fields of knowledge. And I would like just to conclude with an example of freedom, I think. Uh, I, I give you the, the, the cover of a, um, of a dissertation thesis that uh, uh, Maria Magotti, a political scientist student, uh, wrote uh, in the academic year 1975-1976 to graduate in political sciences, she decided in that period to focus uh, on a specific issues about female conditions, 
The title of uh, her dissertation is the following, The Women's Conditions and the Extra Domestic Job, an Empirical Research Study Among Female Textile, textile Workers. It's not something that we can take for granted. This decision, this choice of Maria Magotti to focus on this specific subject in that decade. It was a try, let's say, to claim their view, to take space in that context. Basically, it was, as I told you before, an example of freedom. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to you, Andrea, for uh, this wonderful picture of uh, women and academic freedom. I am looking the eyes of uh, Claudia because I don't know how many minutes uh, we have. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank again all the, the speakers, especially for um, this, uh, um, this wonderful presentations that in my point of view, uh, they, sh they have shown how our craft is not only to, is not limited to discover the past, but also to explain how the complexity of the past can help us to understand the present. And so I would like to open the discussion if some of you have uh, some comments, remarks, also from a very contemporary perspective or related to specific problems and aspects. It would be very happy to open uh, a discussion. Thanks to all of you. Uh, I have a question for Paola and one for Hannah. Um, uh, as for Paola's question, I uh, wanted to go back uh, for a moment to the discourse of the Concetto Marchese, where he invites uh, students to, uh, to join the resistance. And I was trying to link this to the, the, the role that students have in, within this principle of academic freedom, which is often downplayed in, in also in the conceptualization of, of what academic freedom is. So I, I wanted if you could, and, and what I found interesting uh, through the, the passage you quoted is the fact that uh, academic freedom uh, seems to me to be expressed as both a right and a duty for students. So they do enjoy rights, but they, they need to actually fight for their rights, and, and that's their duty. So thinking of um, the history of the University of Padova uh, and, and actually comparing Italy with, for instance, Germany, where in the humble tradition, uh, conceptualization of academic freedom, there is from the very uh, beginning uh, uh, in, in the late uh, 19th century, the idea that students have a role in academic freedom. And then in the US with the 1915 uh, codification of the American University professor. So linking Padova in Italy to, to Germany, to the US, when can we think that students acquire a role in the, in the codification of, uh, of academic freedom? And I have a question for Hannah, or if, shall, I, shall I make it now? Yeah. Okay. And, and I, I find very interesting what you said uh, in, at the beginning when you said uh, censorship is not secret. And I, again, I'm, I'm not an historian, I'm, I'm working between anthropology and sociology. I was trying to link to the present. And I was wondering if uh, uh, censorship is not secret, Comparing the past and the present, can we say, and, and thinking of Italy and Europe, so formerly democratic countries today, um, can we say that in the past the censorship was more codified in rules and was and, and, and somehow expressed in a more visible and official way through state and church power? And can we say that today, like many exponents of the new censorship theory say that in contemporary times, censorship has become more diffuse 
and slippery and therefore difficult to tackle. And this would also connect to what you were saying. I mean, how difficult was the life of scholars in the past and how difficult is today? Uh, because from our experience as scholars and also as uh, scholars at risk Italy, one of the features that come across in the narratives of scholars today is that they are not always able to tackle when the consequences of breaking censorship will come. Thanks. So, as for my question, thank you very much. This is a difficult question. But, uh, and, uh, however, I think that it is difficult, so I, I'm going to give a very partial answer, which is easier in the case of Pado, I believe, than in other universities, because we know traditionally from the history of the University of Padua that one of the features of the first community of students that came here in the 13th century was specifically that um, we, we would say today the right, but we would say for the 13th century the privilege to decide for their own study programs and for the election and the appointment of professors. Uh, so if we want to, to, let's say, draw a continuity, we can say that in Padua, since its very foundation, students have an agency in the management of the institution. But here I'm going to be really um, uh, anachronistic. We have, what we have tried to do in the book we have, uh, has been that of finding some defining moments in which the student community took this agency. And there are many in the story of the university, also beyond, of course, and after this very beginning, which has been uh, ended out by the historiography in Padua as typical of Padua, but was not the case. So it's not that this group of students migrated from Bologna to come to Padua because in Padua we were offering this freedom. They migrated from Bologna because there they couldn't have the privilege they had before. They also go to Vicenza or to the other places. Padua had a good position, so it's, for sure, it is attested that this is the beginning of this beautiful friendship between the city and the students, but they didn't know what they would find, okay, somehow. So it's a, uh, uh, but then in the volume, we have tried to find several moments in which students take, uh, speak out, let's say. One, for instance, uh, one of the, uh, I mean, I like old chapters, but particularly that uh, on uh, uh, 1848 and uh, um, uh, the 8th February, written by Enrico Francia. This shows particularly well the moment in which students there um, uh, join uh, the, the revolt and uh, uh, join the university tradition with patriotism. Again, uh, tomorrow there will be one of our authors, Aurelio Manzi, that will speak specifically on students at the part on advocacy. So 1968 is another moment in which, again, students, uh, and uh, in Padua they do that, of course, uh, by retracing uh, this tradition, using these same uh, words, and going back uh, uh, to, to, that, uh, to that tradition. Of course, the kind of, um, of uh, representations that students have today, it's something completely different because mass university is a totally different kind of university as the one that we try to reconstruct in the book. This is a, there is a part in the introduction in which we say that one problem that we have as historians and that institutions that are very different thing, they carry the same name. University at the time, university today, a library in the 16th century, a library today. So this, uh, of course, uh, it's an obligation for a historian to reflect upon this continuity. However, we have to admit that they are really two different things.
Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think I'd respond by saying that secrecy, I don't think that secrecy and censorship are the same thing. But I think that extreme secrecy can have the downstream effect of censoring, right? So that if something is so secret that information about it isn't happening, it has the effect of repressing conversation around it, right? Um, but I'd add, as we think about contemporary issues and, and ways in which censorship um, operates in contemporary societies, scholars suggest, it's not 100% clear because it's shrouded in secrecy, but scholars suggest that the Great Firewall of China, right, the Chinese censorship apparatus, probably employs about a million censors, right? So when we think about what the, the scope of censorship that operates in different places in our, in our global societies today, I, I do think that there's something to be learned from putting our understanding of how censorship operated in the past into conversation um, with with what may or may not be happening. One of the one of the questions that I think is quite interesting is that as I've talked about, you know, books circulating with parts blacked out or ripped out or with a license. One of the things that schol contemporary scholars again of censorship in China talk about is the ways that um, Chinese censorship sometimes operates by friction, that is not by completely preventing access, but like slowing the internet as you attempt to reach certain um, certain kinds of materials. And that this, these, these um, friction-based systems also have the effect of preventing widespread use. Um, a word about the stakes, how difficult was it to operate as a scholar in Counter-Reformation Padova? Um, I just say, I think the owning, you know, owning a copy of a book by, written by Leonhard Fuchs, right, the guy holding the flowers, um, you you wouldn't lose your life for that. You'd lose your book. The Inquisition might come, and if you had, didn't have it censored and you didn't have a license, they could take your copy, and that would be a bummer because you'd be out a bunch of money and you wanted that book. Um, but your life isn't at stake for that. However, your life would be at stake for circulating, you know, copies of the Bible in the vernacular, copies of Martin Luther, uh, famous physician uh, Geronimo Donzellini, at, um, who circulated in the area but was based primarily in Venice. I mean, he was he was drowned alive in the lagoon for circulating prohibited books. So the stakes of censorship were were life and death, though also with a gradation, again, as we think about what topics people could potentially access or not. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Hassan from Afghanistan and I'm visiting scholar at risk at University of Milan. Actually, uh, your speed and talk is very well, and based on the cultural or knowledge of developed country, and all of the speech uh, according to academic freedom, advocacy, academic speech, is very well and adopted with your cultural, your developed countries. Uh, most of your audiences uh, from com come from developing country. For example, we live in Afghanistan that uh, we have facing with a regime that uh, a fascist regime or a dictatorism regime that took it every kind of uh, freedom that we never have at least <laughs> Even even living, <laughs> especially uh, scholars or academic, what the, the question is that how what is your opinion in in developing in developing country like Afghanistan or some uh, audience that have been come from? Uh, what should we do that we <laughs> reach to the the, the at least uh, freedom of? Uh, S uh, civil society or something like that, like that you're speaking. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I think that my intervention here is as a historian, right? Um, but I think that one of the things that the past offers is to remind us that Padova has not always been a free space for the people who live here either. Um, and that I think others would argue uh, continues to have restrictions on what it means to be free in Padova. Um, so I guess I've, I've used this as an opportunity. I wouldn't presume to have the expertise to tell you um, what your next steps should be, but I would offer from, from my area of expertise and my field of study that we're gathering here at a really important moment, right? I, I mean, 800 years since the founding of this university, and I think we have the opportunity to reflect on being part of a long struggle um, about academic freedom and about the role that the university could play in making lives and the world better. So I guess my, my perspective here is to say, um, I hope you have the space to reflect personally in the coming weeks and months um, and the, the past and being in this particular place gives you uh, insight and fulfillment. Thanks. To me, I would join and say that uh, what we wanted to show with the book and today with the presentation is very much the history of a struggle. So as far as the struggle is possible, then there are margins of negotiation. When there's no struggle anymore, then even a place like Padua, when evoking freedom, as in the, ca and the, in the case of the rector Anti that I was showing, then is doing it by emptying this co that concept of its very origins. So, um, of course, we were saying yesterday Padua is exceptional, as an exceptional story, as far as also in the darkest moment of the counter-reformation, that is the one that Anna was speaking about, this struggle was possible. Of course, there is a Girolamo Donzellini, who he struggled his entire life against the Inquisition. After the third trial, he's put to death uh, in the lagoon. There were many others that find other expedients. We don't believe that the history of Padua is the history of a model of success, of freedom. We think it is an observatory that allows you and has produced enough sources on this direction to see the struggle. So of course, as Anna was saying, this is, doesn't want to be, let's say, it's not that we can speak of a direction that we can give, but it was important for us to be here today uh, because the 800 years of the University of Padua correspond that it is for any, every institution that is natural to, to the kind of celebration. And what we think it is important, it is worth underlying, especially for the time that we study, because even if today I presented all the book, I'm also like Anna, a specialist of the 16th century history of the book. However, um, we wanted to show that specifically this time, that is the golden age of the Libertas, the sources show us a time of, uh, of sometimes prolific, sometimes very dark struggle. So that was more or less our goal, I would say. I would add a few, few word, words. Uh, I have the impression that in the contemporary world, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't know in the past, but the, um, the border between freedom and unfreedom is, uh, I mean, we don't have a situation of absolute freedom, uh, uh, and maybe uh, we don't have a complete uh, uh, situation of uh, absolute uh, non-freedom. So uh, uh, one of the things is, uh, uh, and uh, the, the quotation of Paola uh, about the rector ante is very meaningful because uh, it indicates how uh, you can have a rhetoric of freedom without having a development uh, of freedom or a, a, a practice of freedom. So uh, we have to deal with the, with the concept which is uh, very problematic, although we know that there are situations which are 
in which freedom is practiced more and free situation in which uh, practicing freedom is really difficult and problematic, etc. But I think we shouldn't think to uh, uh, a contraposition, a Manichaean situation, but more of uh, the uh, um, moving of borders between uh, uh, the possibility of freedom and the limitation of freedom. And uh, that's why I think it's important to reflect upon freedom, because uh, it, in contemporary world, as well as in modern world, it, it permits us to, to understand what we intend for freedom, uh, to see the conflicts between different actors uh, who looks, uh, which uh, look for freedom uh, and, uh, and uh, also uh, um, looking at the actors that are inside university can be problematic. There can be conflict between students and professor, for example. I mean, and the freedom of some of, of the ones does not correspond forcefully with the freedom of the others. So uh, there, there are many implications, and uh, uh, which, which helps probably to, to understand uh, um, also uh, um, the difference between different situations, but also uh, um, w which can be the, the link and also the, 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 the uh, confrontation that we can have on different situations. Uh, thanks for your information. I want to share something with you about Afghanistan, uh, about the situation of women. You know, it's um, uh, clear to all of you that uh, the situation is worse for women. But uh, historically, when I wanted to uh, write something, there is our story is uh, mostly um, right by the male. It means there is nothing mentioned about the situation of women in uh, Afghanistan, or sometimes uh, they just uh, uh, make clear a, a few points. But, uh, but as a um, PhD scholar of political science, I studied the, uh, for one century about the situation of women in Afghanistan. Uh, from uh, 19, uh, 19 until uh, 1929, the first period uh, of uh, feminist duration in, in Afghanistan started. It means for uh, 10 years, uh, um, uh, the girls uh, uh, had the um, right to go to school, they had the uh, right to go to university, and um, it was um, mentioned in our constitution. It means uh, there is no other sources about this, but when we read the uh, constitution of Afghanistan, for the first time, it mentioned that the girls have the um, uh, uh, right to go to school or uh, education, free education for them. After that, for four years, uh, from uh, uh, 1929 until 1933, uh, uh, it means for four years, uh, there were nothing for the female. Again, it means they back like now, they had a duration of, like now. After that, for, for four decades, from uh, 33 until uh, 73, it was a good duration for the female. They had the um, right to work, to, to education, to access to education, to going to school. Again, uh, something happened. It was um, until the sweet um, or the Russian attack to Afghanistan, you know, the situation was um, not so good, but it was um, okay for the female. Uh, after that, when the Russia came, again, when the Mujahideen started jihad against Russia, the, the most important uh, population of Afghanistan were female. They affected by the politics of Russia, America, or other uh, uh, power they wanted to compete in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the, the first duration of the Taliban as a child, I, I remember that everything, that it was so worse for us, to, there were nothing for the female. For, uh, in 2021, again, the uh, duration of um, opportunity started for us. We were thinking it is opportunity, but it wasn't, because uh, if we were uh, like before in the duration of the Taliban, in, in the first duration, maybe we used to be like that. It means our life was like that, we accepted, maybe we could accept. But now, totally different, we, we turn back in the duration, 
uh, about uh, 20 years um, before in this situation that we are most of the female are PhD scholar they are master degree they have master degree they are they are working in in this time uh, when I wanted to start something to write about the story woman story in Afghanistan I don't have access to any uh, books about women in Afghanistan it is uh, it was my comment and uh, now I want to ask you um, which approach I can use f to write a book because I started to write just I have my story and I have my friend's story they, they can explain to me but as you know in, in a scientific book we must uh, mention some some uh, references uh, is it possible that just about uh, I write a book about my story my friend's story and it will be uh, uh, for the future maybe it will be helpful uh, to have some sources for the other, they know what happened in this duration in Afghanistan and how is the situation now. You know, if it be like uh, now, uh, I see sometimes uh, people forget that uh, what is going on in Afghanistan, but as I am a member of that country, I know the situation is not good. So if it be after some times, maybe all the world will forget what happened in this duration, and the people of Afghanistan maybe used to be to live under the control of the Taliban, and the Taliban will be recognized by the by, by the international community. Actually, the the problem is that international community most of the time make problem for the female in Afghanistan because in in all negotiation, the main focus, the main point, the main concept was women rights. When the leader come to the power in Afghanistan, like now the Taliban, just they are focusing how they can make limited for the female and achieve their their um, gain. It means it is a like a, a international community and the leader of Afghanistan. They are doing a business according to the uh, rights of women in Afghanistan. I want to um, write a book to to announce to the all the world. If sometimes you have opportunity to negotiate with a, a, a group of people like now, don't focus on the woman right because it is it is maybe you think it is good for you, but you cannot uh, um, support us. Why you are making some problem for us? Actually, now if the the school are closed just because of this. Uh, girls are waiting for the school. Taliban are saying, okay, if the international community recognizes us, we will give this opportunity to the family. But the, the, the children like uh, um, 12 years old, he or she, she doesn't know what is going on. But uh, you, the international community, the UN, all know what's going on. Uh, it was a question about, uh, I think maybe it will be related to your work, because I, I want to write a book about this, because uh, I don't want to forget this hard situation for the uh, women in Afghanistan. Maybe it will be related to the um, uh, professor who, who is working in human rights, because women are also human. Uh, we must think about this, how we can support um, the female and how we can so, uh, have a historical, like um, a story uh, written by, by female for the female to mention the, the problem of uh, women in Afghanistan. Because my master's degree also was uh, the challenges of women in Afghanistan. But I couldn't uh, um, access, I didn't access to the books about women. Thank you. So, uh, uh, of course, the, I mean, the issue you, you explain to us is very complicated to, to deal with. Uh, and I cannot uh, give you an answer, basically. But, of course, it's, it's very important to foster uh, this kind of studies uh, about women and women and female conditions that doesn't adopt a perspective from, let's say, European uh, culture and so on. So it, it would be a perfect choice to uh, improve this kind of studies, starting from researchers who are able to work in, in the specific field, in your case, in Afghanistan. But uh, yeah, of course, it, it's difficult. And I cannot have an answer for, for, for it. Mm, it's even, of course, in Europe for many centuries the history was written by a, 
a male perspective and then the situation changed but the context was completely different but what you you said uh, it gives me the, the opportunity i think just to uh, connect your question with the one of your colleague uh, it's about freedom and and so on and I'm an historian, so the only things that I can say that when you uh, deal with these uh, stories, such as the one about the female presence in the universities, for instance, you can find it e very easily that it's not a linear history. It's not something that uh, uh, it was worse in the past, and now we can arrive in a, a different context, in a different situation, in a better situation. I don't know if you got my point. It's not a linear history. And Carlotta Sarba and I, when we uh, co-headed these volumes, we uh, decided to emphasize this history of conflict, of deceleration and accelerations. And the history of Afghanistan that you gave us very shortly, it's a history of acceleration and deceleration. And uh, of course, as I said before, uh, if you don't have the access of, uh, to the archives, for instance, you cannot write an history about female condition in Afghanistan from an historical perspective. If you don't have the possibility to do research, maybe the, the first step is just try to compare uh, and just try to adopt the lens of the perspective adopted by other uh, national historiographies who, which struggles with the same issues and just try to compare, to adopt, and to uh, use that uh, methodology in order to inspire you in your research. This is the first step, but of course it's something that it's, it's very easy to say and not to, uh, to, um, to put in writing a book or doing research. So uh, I got your point, but... I would also add that uh, the, the, what you propose, the fact of uh, writing your own history and to collect the history of other women, it's very important because actually uh, uh, oral history is part of the way in which contemporary historians understand and uh, construct uh, uh, the history of recent time, uh, also uh, for the limitations of archives, etc. Moreover, this uh, interviews and this uh, uh, essay and these uh, autobiographical writings can help in the future to uh, have a different uh, perspective on uh, women's the women's situation and uh, their own uh, uh, view of the situation uh, in a situ when when uh, archival documents or other sources will be available so i think it's a very good uh, uh, a very good idea to collect uh, to collect uh, women history also from immigrants and the people that are not at the moment in uh, in Afghanistan. Can I add um, a quick quick thanks for sharing your expertise with us, and then also a reminder that writing a book it can be an act of resistance, and that is as well as an act of memory of recording memory. Um, when I showed the book by Camilla Erculiani, the woman apothecary, most of the copies of that book were destroyed, but not all of them. She was silenced by the Inquisition, but traces of her life, of her struggle, which she acknowledges as a struggle. She writes about it, saying, no one takes me seriously because I am a woman. But I'm, these aren't vain ideas, this is, this is science. Um, and it, I mean, it's like, what, almost 500 years later, and we're still able to see that. So I will encourage you to write um, and wish you all, all the best on, on your project and your studies. Thank you for doing them. We are sorry, but uh, for Organizational and practical reasons, I think we don't have time for other questions. Maybe we can come back uh, in another discussion lately. Please, uh, please, uh, Claudia. Is it working? Yes, thanks, Andrea. Thank you all very much. I'm, I'm afraid we need to close uh, because we have a session starting at 2.30. 
So I'm inviting you to come to the cloister. We can have some food together and then please be back at 2.30. There are two things I would like to say before uh, we stop also, kind of uh, uh, wrap up to this beautiful session. Uh, we are very, very grateful uh, to the department, to all the author, to you presenters this morning. When we discussed the possibility of having this uh, session as the opening of the conference, we thought, you know, we really want to hear and learn and know about your research, but also what, see what are uh, the, the trends uh, and the trajectories that we can take uh, from the past. Uh, I think the session this morning proved uh, beyond expectation how close and relevant the issues you've been dealing with are uh, to our discussion. So thank you very much because you certainly set the stage uh, for something that we will be discussing. Now speaking as SAR Italy, we started uh, drafting yesterday with Esther and Francesca a list of ideas and to-dos. And the sense is that the list is growing already very long and we're only at the beginning of the conference. So thanks for this, um, for this new commitment. I think at this point and listening to the conversation and also to the questions, uh, it feels uh, we, have, uh, we have a privilege and a responsibility. Responsibility to me, and we are uh, discussing this as uh, SAR Italy, is to engage a lot more the leadership of our universities in the activities that we're doing. It's not just delegates to SAR, but it's uh, you know, people responsible for international relations and rectors uh, having the university taking up and making their voices heard. Uh, so that's maybe an exercise that we need to discuss how to do building on our histories. But on the other side, I think we have a privilege and the privilege is that we can carry out this conversation precisely as we've been doing yesterday and today. So this dialogue and the continuous uh, call and request uh, that come from some of our guests, uh, from those who've been writing before you histories of displaced scholars, and some of these people are here in the room. So I think there is a lot that you can share uh, as we maybe move out of the, of the room and you can talk to each other. But in a sense, I think the privilege is that really we can carry this forward, uh, um, being in this uh, dialogue uh, as an act of resistance. So thank you for raising that. Uh, so now we have the break, uh, we can have lunch together, and please be back at 2.30 because the session is with online guests uh, from Brussels and university institutions, so we would like to start on time. Thank you. Thank you.